Everything not saved will be lost. That's a quote from Nintendo on some game in the 80s which I can't remember and my research didn't highlight, but hey ho. Ladies and gentlemen, and variations thereupon, welcome to episode 2. My name is Gadget, and this is Modern Escapism. How we doing? Very good. Brilliant. Very good. Okay. So, for anyone who joined us last week and coming into this week, you're probably expecting the dulcet North Yorkshire tones of one Mr. Oodles O'Dim. But that's not how we do things around here. This is a rotating cast, so my name is Gadget. I'll be hosting this week. Next week you'll have a different host. The week after it will be another host after that. And it'll just keep cycling with that until we get back to Oodles and you realise that you've been through seven hosts. Um, so we have, instead of doing two episodes this week, we're doing one episode, and we have three illustrious guests from our roster of seven. And for introductions, first of all, we have a man who has 10,000 spoons but only needs a knife. It's Kieran. <laughs> You're right, Gadget. How's it going? <laughs> Next up, we have a man so advanced medical science is yet to catch up with him. It's Biggie. What's up? And lastly, some say his teeth are made of sherbet. And he has no rational fear of slippers. All we know is he's called Stig. Hello there. <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't help myself. I had to do that intro, so I, I literally <laughs> decided to do a Top Gear joke just for Stig, and then had to write it for you to write jokes for you two as well, <laughs> so I could have it. Oh, I didn't even get that. <laughs> oh, come on, Kieran. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I did get mine though. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so last time Oodles was asking us questions as a way to get to know us. But we're not doing that this time because you already know who we are. So we have a format. Now this format is subject to change. Things might come, things might go. We are, we're just working out what works at the minute. But we, we have several sections that we're going to go through. Our first section, which we're going to talk about in depth, probably, is our first recurring one. Has Biggie finished Final Fantasy VII yet? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Our next section. <laughs> Thanks, <Gadget. laughs> honestly, honestly uh, I, I considered like writing like a full twenty-five second theme going into that one just for Biggie to go. No. <laughs> Feel free to edit and just put that as no. Uh, no, I probably won't. But yeah, week by week, we will constantly ask Biggie whether he's finally finished Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> Uh, no, the first the first actual feature is uh, we're going to go back in time and we're going to ask Stig if we had any feedback for the, uh, our debut episodes last week. Uh, yes, we got quite a lot of good, uh, feedback, really. Really good feedback. Um, extremely positive, which we're all very grateful for. Um, you know, yeah, we're all thank pretty you. thankful for the numbers that we received and the downloads and the, the reviews. Five-star reviews, remember? <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, we had some good feedback over um, Twitter and some other means. I'll run through a few at first. Um, first, we'll, well, we'll start with Angry Kurt, Kurt Lewin. Uh, he actually got involved with some of the questions. So he told us about his favourite film, which is Whiplash. Uh, his favourite game is Portal. His book is Free Economics. And he, conspiracy theory, he actually liked the Mandela effect, um, which he discovered because of Jeebus. So... He's pretty. Uh, he says thank you to that because it. Uh, I think it sent him, in, him down a bit of a rabbit hole. It's a very I, easy rabbit hole to fall down. I fell down yeah. that one as well. I did a lot of YouTube research on that one, and it drove me bloody batty. It's brilliant. Absolutely <laughs> yeah. brilliant. You, you're just misremembering. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember. <laughs> and uh, his favorite joke. I actually quite like this one. The advantages of easy origami are twofold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that. That's good. Very good. Very good. I mean, it's a lot better than mine. Mine was terrible, but mine was for a three-year-old. So, <laughs> yeah. less discriminating uh, audience there. Yeah, uh, Chris uh, at Chris underscore Fenton eighty two also got involved. His uh, greatest gaming achievement is doing all the weapons cheat at the start of Tomb Raider two and blowing up a tiger with a grenade launcher. <laughs> I, uh, I think we've all done that, haven't we? Uh, Put, I, put the hook, put the god modes on the all weapons oh yeah. modes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah I haven't done that with Tomb Raider 2, but it's yeah, it's, uh, no, I've done yeah, a lot. definitely on Grand Theft Auto. You know? Oh yeah, absolutely. 
drop oh, a tag. There was some um, rumour of a nudity cheat that everyone was trying to work out how to input, <laughs> oh, and it was actually oh, yeah. fake <laughs> news. It's very yeah, early. Fake that. news. That's one of those playground. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, maybe that's a Mandela effect. You missed the... <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> I, I was always more of a lock the butler and uh, try and lock the butler. Oh, yeah, that's crazy, brilliant. Man. Yeah, I mean, was yeah. that not the point of the game? Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. may still be in there now. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be well fed. Uh, yeah, so a few bits more of uh, some more feedback. Uh, Matthew, uh, Matt O'Lawlin. Sorry if I pronounced that completely Loughlin. wrong. Loughlin, Matt O'Loughlin. Uh, potentially, at O'Loughlin MJ. He said he loved the show. I really thoroughly enjoyed it, even though I'm not a gamer. I don't own a console, never finished a game or anything, even FIFA. The Mandela effect has blown my mind. Also, that description of Die Hard has ruined a great Christmas film. <laughs> Sorry, Stig. Yeah, I and we've talked about this today in the Discord. <laughs> I, I just, One hot topic. Yeah. I just I just ruined my description of Die Hard. I love that film. I could probably tell you why I love it with more of being less put on the spot. So, yeah, it's a great film. It's a wonderful action film. It is over the top. I know that. But I was trying to make a point that it isn't compared to some other action films. But, um, yeah, I'm with I'll, you, I mate. Can't... I am with you. I'm in your camp. Yeah. I'm in the stew camp. Yeah, good, good. Uh, a few more. Uh, uh, pickled um, David Rutt. He said, I've listened to the first 25 minutes so far. I'm enjoying it. You all seem to have good chemistry and work well. I've never seen the thing. And he now, and then a follow up. He said, I've listened to most of part one and really enjoyed it. The gaming backlog stuff was great. Really nailed my opinions on Animal Crossing too. So not only um, there's some other people out there who don't like Animal Crossing, it seems. Well, yeah, some of us have to be right about these things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've never played one. It just it doesn't appeal to me. It's it a, a busy work kind of game just it's not my thing there, there, yeah, there are there are benefits to them i think the simple thing is sometimes it's nice just to sit there and have something to just let your mind kind of chew over at the end of the day um yeah I can, for me I can animal kind of Cro- see the appeal yeah for me animal crossing was not that game it's stardew valley mm. yeah yeah agreed completely wow. um let's see uh we had feedback here i don't know how to take this one at uh, idaho says i started listening and fell asleep Given that I listen to podcasts to fall asleep, it's actually something I look for in a podcast. So well done. So I think we, I think that's a positive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, that's, yeah, that sounds like a positive. It's not like a backhanded compliment yeah. or anything like that. No, we'll accept I'd, that one. I will. I'd do, like yes. to know what the uh, the other podcasts that they listen to that make them fall asleep are. <laughs> yes, <Top> me too. <laughs> <laughs> what should be the last last podcast on the left where they have got people screaming on in the microphones and it's just like, oh, this is so relaxing. <laughs> But it's interesting Absolutely. the way people listen to podcasts as well. Uh, some people do it while they're working, driving, dog walking. There's so many different ways that you can just relax it. Clearly, this guy likes to uh, sit back and nod off. But there you go. <laughs> yeah. And uh, give us uh, one more there, Stig. Uh, one more. Um, this is a good one from Little Lolly Two Scoops at Little, Little Lolly Two One. Favourite part, the discussion about the Mandela effect, the reactions to the different ones was very entertaining. So I think that the Mandela effect is, you know, went down very well with people by the sounds of it. So a lot of people may not have known about it and it looks as though uh, Jeebus has got people looking into stuff. So happy with that. Oh yeah, he, he'll be very happy about that, the academic that he is, getting people researching. He will be. Um, okay, well, sincerely thank you for all of the feedback that we've received. It's been really wonderful to have this um outpouring of support that we've had over the last week um just quickly we were all really nervous coming into this one i mean as we as was described a couple of times oodles has done podcasts in the past he's been on several of them over the years but the rest of us were all really new to this one um i can't speak for the lads the closest i've been is i've done youtube videos and twitch streams and all that and other others in the group have had different experiences with kind of making content or putting stuff out there in different forms but this is the first time we've all come as, together as a podcast and for there to be so many of us and for us to all to pretty much get along all of the time we've had a few we haven't even had any arguments or anything like that have we it, we are really happy that this has been so well received and we hit we hit the charts hard I mean, we peaked in, on the top uh, top 200 in the leisure section in iTunes at number 13. Not yep, first bloody week. 13! Right. Absolutely brilliant. There are rumours that our launch was more successful than Google Stadia. 
um, unsubstantiated. <laughs> but, um, they're rumors. That's a really low bar to pass. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely above Ouya. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, but it's yeah, it's been a great week, hasn't it? Absolutely oh, great. It's, it's it's been absolutely fantastic, and we've you know we need always, you know Jeebus has been fantastic doing the Twitter account. We've had so much social interaction on there. Um, we even ha- we even had a retweet challenge completed, which we'll talk about later. Um, but that one, yes, we will. The, 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 yeah. <laughs> the fact the, the the fact that we're approaching the followers that we have so quickly is is just really wonderful. And from the bottom of our hearts, as the start of this second episode, the first proper format, I want to thank I, on behalf of Modern Escapers, want to thank everybody for supporting us. And we're going to get into the podcast proper now. You know who we're talking to, so. Let's deal with the format. And what we've got up for you next is the Nexus. So this is the Nexus. It holds together the northern lands of Boliter. Wait a minute. No, that's a different Nexus. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we've been up to this week. Um, so this is a place where where we can kind of describe the kind of media that we've been escaping with this week. So uh, what, what we've done to procrastinate, what we've done to enjoy ourselves, what we've done in our downtime. So Kieran, do you want to kick off with this one and let us know what you've been up to? Yeah, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is something that me and you, Gadget, have spoken about a fair bit fairly recently. So I've decided to get Divinity Original Sin 2. Yes. Yeah, so Gadget and I have spoken about this quite a lot. Um, A lot of it being guidance of what to actually do in it and what to do to get some of the best bits out of it. And funnily enough, one of those bits was uh, get the ability that allows you to talk to animals. Ah, Pet Pal. Love Pet Pal. Yes, brilliant so if yeah if i hadn't have had that skill in this game i'd have been uh i'd have been lost i'd have lost out on so much funny and also very sad moments it's it's so uh, it's one of those sorry, it's one on. of those parts of the game that is very crucial to your enjoyment of it or at least i found it when i played through very crucial to your enjoyment of it that the game doesn't tell you it's a good idea to have because yeah. with it being such a pro- like a proper role playing game quote unquote it's basically you're supposed to discover all these things yourself but yeah. Pet Pal, I mean, if you don't have Pet Pal, you don't get to speak with one of the core NPCs that you meet at the very start of the game uh, yeah. in Solora and Quarkus. <laughs> <laughs> the quest for the giant, the Great Acorn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You must, you must stop the Great Acorn before it destroys all of Rivalon and all that kind of so, thing. So, uh, Big Inch Stu, uh, do, you, do you two know about Divinity Original Sin? Or I Sin? have one and two in my backlog. We shall say no more. <laughs> that was expected. Yeah. Mm. No, I know. I know the name. Don't know even what. Don't even know what type of game it is or, or yeah. anything. Um, so it to, seems... to, to, sorry. Uh, so to f- fill you in and anyone listening who doesn't know what the heck I'm blathering on about, it's a um, it's like a classical style RPG, not the um, like D and D rules like Baldur's Gate and whatnot. But um, it's like a party based thing. I was going to say, it's about as close to D&D rules as you can get without it being a and d game. Oh, okay, right. It, 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 does, yeah. it does kind of subscribe to a lot of the same tropes that Baldur's Gate does. The main difference is that the combat is turn-based, as if you were actually yeah. playing D&D with a game master. Um, the fact that it also has a voiced game master as well, which is pretty cool. He's, he's a sassy bitch, that game master. I love him. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the narrator. He's, he's great. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's like a fantasy setting. At the beginning of it is basically... Um, there's uh, sorcerers are being wound, uh, rounded up all over the world and stuck onto this island where they're going to be cured and uh, you basically have to find your way out of there uh, but yeah it's it's incredibly well written there's so many endearing characters and events and, that go on in it so um, one of the most recent things I've run into now um, was a uh, a bear that was dead, and then shortly later on, I met its cub asking where its mummy was. Yeah, oh, I remember that. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's you, you don't. There's so many unexpected, really heavy parts in it, and so far, the vast majority of them have all involved animals. Yeah, so that they're seems not, a they're bit not harsh. Like not having that pet pal um, active. Then, if you weren't aware of it, then would that have made this all kind of difficult well yeah it's it's um you, there's a lot of it well it's, it's optional stuff but um it's 
it would be a massive shame to miss out on some of the stuff I've seen so far. The th- simply because you didn't have an ability you didn't know you yeah. needed. The thing, the thing is, the pep pal thing, and I, I don't want to spoil anything for you, Kieran. But as you kind of get further into the game, it does become more important. There are a few places where, if you can speak to like a dog, the dog being the friendly dog that it is, will say, "Oh, my master does this and that and the other." If you go through that yeah. door, and it's just like, "Ah, there you go. There's a hint to complete the quest." You know, stuff like that. It's <laughs> like there are actual moments. Oh, when you're kind of tend when you go through sewers, you speak to rats. Rats yeah. will tell you who comes and goes in the sewers. That kind of thing. It does help you with a lot of deductive reasoning in the puzzles. So yeah. it's a really important skill. The reason they give it to you as a choice, though, is because you don't have to take Pet Pal and you could take some... Like, if you're doing a combat build, you don't give a crap about having being able to speak to animals. You just want to blow the shit out of yeah. something. So, you know, you you don't have to take it if you don't want to. But especially for a first playthrough, it's so it's such an important skill. I'm very glad that you ended up going, going and getting it because it does prove <laughs> to be useful. Consider it duly noted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um... The uh, the last bit I'd like to talk about in Divinity is we know the you know fantasy tropes of the names people have. So it, it, in this game, for example, there's a character named Siwan and one named Narin and Baladin, and uh, it turns out my current quest is I'm looking for a person named Gareth. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, so Gareth. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. That I I remember coming up on that one as well because it's just like oh oh you you need to find I think he's a paladin or something. You need to find this paladin. Yeah. He will help us to safety. Okay, who is he? Sir Gareth. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah, yeah it sort of took me out of it a bit. <laughs> isn't that I, I, I must be, I might be remembering this wrong because I've not read it yet. But isn't that like the case in June that they all have like obscure names, but one of the characters oh, yeah. is just Paul. one of the main characters. Yeah. yeah, it's just a normal name. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, yeah, yeah, that was just like Frank Herbert's just like, oh, fuck it, call him Paul. I fix it in <laughs> yeah. the edit, and then he never did. <laughs> yeah, you get so used to the, those names in movies, games, and whatever, the really um, the extreme ones, that to actually just come across a normal name and something just throws you off of it. Very weird. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Immersion ruined. Yeah. So, Biggie, what have you been up to, mate? It's, I know it's not completing Final Fantasy VII, so what, what, what have we got going? Well, interestingly enough, uh, well, it was to me anyway, after discussing my favourite movie, um, I went back and watched it. So uh, <laughs> I went back and watched The Thing, and not only did I it's enjoy standing. it once again, but um, I ended up watching The Making Of, uh, which uh, you can either find on YouTube, or if you obviously have uh, the Blu-ray yourself, you can uh, watch The Making Of, and it's called Terror Takes Shape, and it's in various chapters. And they literally got um, all of, well, not sorry, not all of the cast, the majority of the cast back. Obviously, the director, uh, John Carpenter, uh, Rob Botin, who did uh, the special effects, and obviously a few other people. And we're discussing the making of it, and it's just so interesting. It must be probably about 90 minutes, I'd say. So it's really in depth, and there's just some really interesting stories about the making of that movie. Um, I'll just give you an example of a couple of things that they brought up. Um, Rob Botin, um, if you don't know, it was probably one of his biggest gigs that he'd done to that point. And uh, one of the big scenes in the movie, I don't really want to ruin it for anybody who hasn't seen it, uh, like Pickled, for example. But there's a scene in there that took uh, months and months to set up. And then the day that they shot it, they were using the mixture of chemicals that Rob Botin was given the sort of free reign to do. There was sort of not this none of this health and safety that we have nowadays. And when they then had to set up some of the fire in the background, it literally blew up the stage. So <laughs> oh, wow. they had to reset up that scene. Uh, it involves um, a head, is all I will say, uh, for those that know. Oh, the movie. I know the one you're talking about, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah. whole scene blew up. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> and he lived on set for a year and a half. And by the that's... end of the movie, he ended up in hospital. They uh, felt that he didn't look good and needed some help to the point where Stan Winston, um, a very famous uh, special effects guy who's done Terminator, just for an example, off the top of my head, uh, he actually did the dog scene at the beginning of the movie, which won't ruin anything for too many people. But uh, yeah, he actually took the slack up a little bit because Rob was just a little bit in over his head. But uh, yeah, just uh, brilliant, uh, really interesting. There's plenty more stories, so I don't want to ruin that for anybody. 
Um, I, I have the impression that the thing was an utterly miserable film to make for the cast and the crew. Um, I think it was because obviously the 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 uh, locations were set in a refrigerator set in LA, and then um, they also filmed it in Alaska and British Columbia. So obviously the sets where they had the uh, freezing background, the mountains, the snow, obviously the conditions were pretty harsh, but. They also said on the flip side that the actors really appreciated being in that environment and they really bonded yeah, because so. they're all living in like bunks in these little uh, rooms uh, wherever they were based. So it just you, became you, a bit you, of You got that with there. the, um, yeah, you got that with the behind the scenes stuff on uh, Game of Thrones when they were talking about all the, the filming they did in Iceland. Yeah. Is it Iceland or Greenland? What? Somewhere up there when they, when they were doing a lot of the Beyond the Wall stuff and they, they were like just living in like small camper vans in the middle of nothing. Yeah, I think and you've got a bond, haven't they, you? Really? Yeah. You either, well, you either bond or you all go a bit mad, really. <laughs> <laughs> one or t'other, right? Uh, there's uh, one other thing that I did. Was, oh, yeah. Uh, I've been reading uh, a comic um, called Ghosted, um, which was created by Joshua Williams and uh, drawn by a guy called Goran Suzuka, who, uh, if anyone's read Why the Last Man, which is another great comic book, um, also recommended but yeah i've just been reading that um it's just about a, a character called jackson um he's a one of the greatest criminal masterminds to ever live um ends up rotting in jail after his last failed school and then a filthy rich collector breaks him out of jail and tasks him to put together an elite team of paranormal experts to do the impossible and steal a ghost from a haunted house of horrors uh, it's, this sounds, sounds incredible. It's basically almost like yeah. a mashup of Ocean's Eleven and The Shining, and it's really good. Really enjoying it. I'm in. Where do I throw my money? <laughs> it's by Image, <laughs> so image, either you right, can get okay. it directly from them or Comic Oxology, any any of the apps that you want to use. But yeah, really enjoying it. Out, really good. Outstanding. That sounds brilliant. Um, Stig, what's been uh, keeping you busy uh, this week? I was just wondering if. Before I get into that, if we could have a little talk about the DC fandom stuff that's happened mm. yesterday. Oh yeah, I saw Twitter explode about this, <laughs> and then pretty much a lot of pictures of Robert Pattinson, which I'm sure you'll talk yeah. about. <laughs> but I've not actually looked into it. What's uh, what's happening? Well, well, the kind of because of this, um, obviously because of COVID nineteen and everything, they couldn't do a Comic Con this year. So DC and Warner Brothers kind of set up their own online event um, where they just revealed a lot of trailers, upcoming movies, upcoming comics, games and everything. But they, they really went in on it. Like it wasn't just a few, oh, this this movie's coming, see you later. Like we had, we had trailers for Wonder Woman, Batman, uh, Zack Snyder's cut of Justice League, um, <laughs> which looks interesting. I mean, it looks like a completely different film. I didn't like Justice League, but I... Does it look um, like a good film? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, this... Justice... Because of the what had happened with him stepping down um, due to tragic events, really, um, Joss Whedon had taken over, and he, he's got all this footage that they're going to do in a four-part special, an hour each, on HBO Max. And... It, none of it looks like anything that was in the original theatrical cut. So he must have shot a buttload of stuff <laughs> if they've managed to get two films out of this. But yeah, it still looks like the old colourless Snyder stuff and really bad use of CGI, but I'll still watch it because I'm interested in how see how it turns it's out. It's been on for a while, Zach's... hasn't it? Zack yeah. Snyder's one of those directors that I think... He's he had something interesting with three hundred, and then he's never grown. No, there seems to be he seems to be a huge fan of far too much CGI and a lot of yeah. style over substance. I don't know if that's me being wrong. I haven't seen that many Snyder did films. Did he do the but... Watchmen? Was that... He did. Yes, yeah, he did. I did like that actually. I thought that was a pretty good uh, adaptation. I, I need to revisit that one day because I I don't remember liking it that much, but some people tell me it's brilliant, but. But yeah, so I think the Wonder Woman looked great. The Batman looks amazing, in my opinion. It looks really good. Um, I think they've they've nailed the look of that. Um, it's going apparently going for like a year two look, so it's like early days Batman. 
Uh, then they reveal. Please, please tell me they're not going to do the origin story again. Like, I can't look at Crime Alley. <laughs> no, I again. don't think so. There's no, there's no hints yeah. of it. There's no hints of it in the trailer, so hopefully not. Um, it looks like uh, Robert Pattinson has stolen our very own Oodles uh, circa 2010 look. <laughs> black, <laughs> black eye makeup. Like the yes, the trailer looks great. I think. Um, yeah, and there's a couple of games. Uh, so we've got Gotham Knights, which is a one to two player game where you control. Batgirl, Robin, the Red Hood on Nightwing. Um. They showed a bit of footage of that. That sounds really good. And then Rocksteady, who did the Arkham games, revealed Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. So Ooh. this is going to be a one, one to four player experience. So you can actually team up with three of your friends if you want. And you could play as uh, Harley Quinn, Captain Boomerang, Deadshot and King Shark. And the premise looks to be as though Superman and the Justice League of been brainwashed and our baddies so you have been tasked with taking them out but we haven't really seen anything other than this cinematic trailer they didn't show any game footage it's not right. scheduled for another two years so the introduction of I'm sure uh, we'll see a bit more. superman at the end of the trailer was quite cool yes that was yeah it was very injustice 2 though i don't it seems a very like injustice 2 did a very similar of a bad superman hmm. um so i don't know whether it's ripping that off a little i'm not i'm not sure how well me having bad superman works in games it's still something that you, it's obviously it's not really been done that much but i'm just thinking it just seems a bit obvious to go well it's superman but he's bad now it yeah and also like superman is like he's invincible mm. practically he's got all these powers but what keeps him from using a lot of them is his good side so if he's a bad guy and surely he's just gonna like crack the planet in half or something like that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So he could no, just fly through the planet. He's, he's going to go to Gotham and he's gonna fight these puny humans and lose for some reason yeah. when he could tear the planet in half. <laughs> yeah, so we'll see. I mean, I I really enjoyed the Arkham games, uh, the Batman games. Yeah, yeah, so they were really good. We'll, we'll see how it comes out. And then uh, last couple of ones, obviously, The Rock uh, announced Black Adam. Um, he's been signed on for that for years. And are they actually releasing that? My God. Yes, it, yeah, they got concept. They had concept footage and art, so that's ready to go ahead. Um, and that as well, he called out the Justice League, so it looks as though they're going to continue with this DC expanded universe stuff. Oh, really? Mm. If depending who takes the helm, it could be good because I like Patty Jenkins, who does the Wonder Woman stuff. I think she does a really good job with that. Yeah, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman was really good, and I'm actually really excited for eighty four. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that trailer looked great. Yeah, this, the 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 other films have just that I've seen from the DC ex- extended universe thing that they're trying. It's also disparate. And I was saying yeah. I was saying to you guys before. It's like it's not like with Marvel. Like Marvel had a vision for the Avengers saga, or at least the f- first third of it when they did Iron Man. You know, each film kind of fit that blueprint. Where all the DC films have just been like, "Here's a superhero, deal with it." <laughs> you know. I think they were playing catch up. Yeah, and that's, I want that I one. Think, I want. Yeah. I want that. Is what basically yeah. what they've done. It's um, weird because the DC universe is kind of in its own way a bit darker than how Marvel normally comes across. But I think Marvel have kind of nailed the movies, and I just don't know about those characters. I'm not even interested in Suicide Squad, really. I don't. I can't get myself engaged with those characters, and I have been a Marvel fan th- for a long time. No. But I just, yeah, it doesn't work the, for me. When it comes to stuff like Suicide Squad, I think they relied too much on the star power. Like, Suicide Squad as a film, across the board, was bad. Let's just admit it. There was not yeah, very, yeah, not much awful. that that film did right. I do think casting Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn was good. She was mm. very good in the role. But Will Smith as Deadshot was so bad. And the rest of them were entirely forgettable. And who keeps casting Cara Delevingne in films is beyond <laughs> me. But, <laughs> but like, Well, the only thing that gives me... Um, you know, I, I have hope for this is James Gunn's directing. He did Guardians oh, of the Galaxy, yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. one of my favourite comic book films. He's a massive Suicide Squad fan. He said over and over again, if he had the choice to do any film, it would have been Suicide Squad. That is the only thing that makes me have a bit of faith. But like you said, the star like there is even more people in this film than there was the one from a few years ago. Yeah. I think there must be about fifteen of them and they're all like massive stars. So like 
is it going to fit fit them in, or are they all just going like, to die in the first like act or what? Like, so yeah, see, it's I, interesting. Let's see where it goes. See, I liked how Marvel approached their star power. Like, you know, we'll start with Robert Downey Jr. He's known, but he wasn't a huge star at the time. He was still having this kind of resurgence after the whole alcohol and yeah. drugs thing, and then that kind of rebuilt his career from that. And then you know they brought in Scarlett Johansson for stuff, and um, but like Chris Hemsworth was pretty unknown unless you watched Australian TV. Um, and the, the, the yeah, well no, it was Ghostbusters was, it was after that. Yeah, he was the yeah. best thing in that movie. He was, personally. Yeah. And I hate to say it, but he was. Well, he was. That yeah. was a dreadful film. Not for the reasons everyone yeah. thought it was, but it was a dreadful film. No. Um, but yeah, Chris Evans as well. Like he'd done what he did, Snowpiercer and a couple of other things. But I don't think he was well known, really. Oh, he did. He was um, Johnny Flame or whatever his name is in Fantastic Four. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's. Um, and so just one last thing on that one uh, they had a Shazam thing they revealed that there's a Shazam 2 called Shazam Fury of the Gods that was it they had a whole panel for literally that <laughs> nothing else that's disappointing although, Shaz- although I'm happy to see a second <laughs> Sh- Shazam because it's nice to see yeah. a DC film that one did well two was good and three was funny yes yeah I enjoyed Shazam but yeah it was nice like they just you know because they couldn't do Comic Con they did this massive event Twitter absolutely exploded and I think they did pretty well. They got me invested in wanting to see stuff. Even the Zack Snyder stuff. Um, I'm quite interested to see how that goes. So, All right, so that fandom stuff sounds pretty interesting. But, Stig, what have you been up to? Not what DC have been up to. <laughs> mm. uh, a couple of things this week. Uh, firstly, I had to re-watch Planes, Trains and Automobiles. Oh. I don't know if any of you saw the news this week <sighs> that... Or last week that Will Smith and Kevin Hart are signed on to do a remake. No, 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 and no I'm going to no. throw up into my own socks. <laughs> <laughs> but it just How made me want to watch How the original. That's one of my favourite yeah. movies, comedies of all time. And I can't, no, it's, no, it's a, it's the yeah. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is the perfect odd couple film. Oh. Because John Candy is brilliant in it. Steve Martin's doing his best tired middle aged man. Which he did so very well, and it's just it. It is the most wonderful escalation of chaos and farce, culminating yeah. in that wonderful bit on the motorway. Oh. And it's so so funny. And no, you cannot remake it. And you yeah. also can't well, remake if you were going to remake it. You can't remake it with two actors who are very well known for playing themselves. They, like Will Smith and Kevin Hart, they're great actors. They're very funny men. They do very good work. But you would be going to see Will Smith and Kevin Hart playing those roles, and it's not right. If you're going to remake it, you do it with unknown actors who are playing the characters, not themselves. I've yeah. never being not snobby or... teared up no, at I... the end of that movie with John Candy's little oh, reveal. God, no, Just it's... every oh, time it gets God. me. Every time. Getting a bit emotional right now. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, I was thinking about that, and, and the obvious thing here is that Will Smith plays Steve Martin role. And Kevin Hart plays a John Candy role because because Kevin Hart is annoying. He can do annoying really yeah. well. I think they might flip it. Well, they did I that think they might them. have this. What was it? I um, think they might have. See, uh, Central Intelligence. They had Kevin Hart playing the straight man, and yeah, uh, the, and Dwayne Johnson playing the kind of annoying a, one. A, yeah, yeah, because he was really annoying in high school. So he kind of never really grew out of it. Yeah, even though he even though he grew a lot of muscles. Um. But yeah, I, I think that that would work out better. So we'll see anyway. Anyway, I had to rewatch the original after that. It just made me want to watch the original, which is I'm going to go amazing. and rewatch it. I, I will too. Yeah. Yeah. I, once, once we're done with this recording, I'll go and watch it. <laughs> and, I, and I suggest anyone who hasn't watched it watches it. Yeah, please <laughs> do. That would be me. I've oh, never seen it. oh my god! Oh, you're oh. In the I'm sorry. <laughs> homework for this week. That, that is your homework. So, when when you talked about the, like an emotional part of it. I Don't think I've seen that, but only parodied in Family Guy. Yeah, Family Guy have done it. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The I, I, it's we're not going to spoil yeah, it for you, but it is just such a wonderful, week. wonderful farce yeah. and wonderful escalation of yeah madness. And it's I think what I always find funniest about it is every time Steve Martin's character has a little bit of peace, he turns around and John Candy's there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and well, I, I do. I absolutely adore John Candy. Steve Martin's an absolute treasure as well. So it's it, right up my alley. Yes, yes. I'd say probably John Candy's best movie personally for me. 
And uh, I'm a big fan of Uncle there. Buck. Uh, it's always been it's my favourite John, John Hughes. Mm. Okay, well, well, yeah, we'll take that one. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. So my, my main uh, couple of ones that I wanted to talk about really was I watched Hamilton for the fifth time. Oh yes, you've been obsessed had, by it. Anyone who hasn't watched Hamilton needs to watch Hamilton. If you don't have Disney Plus, get Disney Plus. Watch Hamilton. If you do have Disney Plus, watch Hamilton. Find a way to watch <laughs> Hamilton because it is amazing. I have watched this five times now in eight weeks i have listened to the soundtrack non-stop my wife and kids are going crazy because <laughs> i keep playing the soundtrack and i literally cannot wait until i can go and see this thing live i know it's not going to be with the same cast but i just want to see it live I'm, uh, but i i am keen to see it because i'm a big fan of lin-manuel miranda um especially yeah. after after i found out that he did the soundtrack to moana which i had no idea mm-hmm. until i rewatched that a few weeks yep. ago um and I mean, I, I, I still think You're Welcome is one of the best Disney songs ever written. Yes, I love it. Yeah. Great movie. Great song. So, yeah, it's definitely on my list to watch at some point. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I went into this completely blind. All I knew about it was that people raved about it being absolutely amazing. I've gone through this weird thing recently where I started to like musicals a lot more. It was never my bag, but recently I've liked, you know, La La Land, Greatest Showman, just things like that that just have such great songs in and so right i'm gonna watch this because everyone says it's amazing it just is the court the chore the, the songs the choreograph of the dancing the storytelling it's just absolutely wonderful and even like lin when lin manuel miranda he isn't the best singer he even admits he's not the best singer but because you can tell he's put his heart and soul into this project when he plays that part like he acts it so well. Like you just see the emotion in his face. You hear it in his voice. And then you have other people like uh, Davy Diggs. He, um, if any of you have seen the most recent Snowpiercer TV show. No, no, no. he, no, it's really good, but he's the lead in that. Uh, but he plays two parts. He plays a character called Lafayette in the first half and Thomas Jefferson in the second. And he just absolutely steals the show. Like these characters do not act like they would have acted 300 years ago. Like, it just... The songs are a mixture of rap and hip-hop and soul, spoken word. Oh, mix soul, that in not with, really. Thank you. Mix that in with traditional show tunes, and it's just great. And it's all colorblind casting. You know, like, the majority of the cast are, are black. It's not like everyone is white because they were back then. So Right. And it works so well. Um, okay. Yeah, enough. it's... It has some great things to say about America that's still very poignant to this day. So, and the last 25 minutes, honestly, it's just a proper tearjerker. So, yeah, if you haven't watched it, please go watch it. That's a hearty, and, a hearty request from Stuart there. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I think everyone needs to watch it. Everyone needs <laughs> yeah. to watch it. I left school years uh, ago. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't even need to know about the War of Independence to, to enjoy it i have the basic knowledge of the war of independence i have no idea about hamilton's life after the war ended and this covers all of that right and you 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 don't need to know any of that because it's all in there the whole thing is about two and a half hours it's all sung there's no spoken word acting everything is done by song oh all of it all of it the whole thing is just you know i'm i'm all right with that i yeah. I, I remember seeing, and it's slightly tangentially, but towards musicals. I remember going to see um, Sweeney Todd in the cinema when the Tim Burton Johnny Depp one came out, and I I, I remember watching. So this, I went to the cinema in Sunderland to see it with my girlfriend at the time, and I remember watching people getting up and walking out when we got twenty minutes in, and not and not a word of dialogue had been said, <laughs> and and I'm sitting there thinking, I know we're in Sunderland, but. Seriously, did you not know it was a musical? And over the years, I've kind of then come to realise that no, it just was. It wasn't people in Sunderland being ignorant of it. It's that I went back and watched trailers, and it was just like none of the trailers actually implied that it was a musical. They just, they just. <laughs> oh. If you watch the trailers for for Sweeney Todd, they they make it look like it's this kind of like thriller, and there's this like epic music underneath it. But it looks like it's kind of like a, a bit of a dark thriller. So yeah. But, yeah, yeah. I do, I do, I do like a good musical, especially one where it is consistently music, not dialogue i'm not 
I don't really like it ones where where people where people bill it as a musical and it's like a Disney film where it's like twenty minutes of dialogue and then a three minute yeah. song. Like if you're going yeah, to call it a musical, no. make it music all the way through all the way throughout. It is mm. it is music from start to finish. There's a little bit of spoken stuff, but it's done with rhyme and kind of poem and spoken words. You know, like yeah. uh, music. You know, with music over the top. So, but it, yeah, it's brilliant. And then just the uh, the second thing this week, I've been listening to an album called "We Get By" by Jamie Webster. Okay. Uh, so this guy is a he's a singer songwriter from Liverpool. He's kind of had a bit of a meteoric rise over the last two years in the area. Uh, he went from singing in a few Liverpool FC based bars, singing the old Liverpool songs and people singing along to it. And he's just kind of, you know, he he went and sang in front of 60,000 people at the Champions League final mm-hmm. fan park. He's been on stage singing along with Jamie Carragher and Jurgen Klopp and other people. Like, he's just kind of been entwined in the whole, like, Liverpool fan base. Uh, he's kind of got a bit of a... Um, an early Arctic monkey sound to him, but more with a acoustic. Like he has that uh, working class background and that kind of working class area voice. So he's obviously Scouse. They've got that, you know, you can hear that Sheffield accent in them. You can hear his Scouse yeah. accent in, yeah. in, in, in him. Uh, you know, he, he absolutely loves the city. You can tell that with his songs. His songs are all about like growing up and living and working in Liverpool. He has a song called This Place, which is all it's pretty much a love letter to Liverpool. Uh, Sky used it as their montage for when Liverpool lifted the title. So he's oh, fantastic. Okay, that's yeah. who that is. Okay, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, but he, so his album just come out this week. Um, he cites some of his influences as bands like the Lars and Oasis, and you can hear some of that in some of his tracks. But it's very acoustic He like poppy acoustic, really, but it's really good, Like especially like if you just want something... In the background, that's you know, that's quite relaxing and an upbeat. It's it's really good. Okay, so, yeah, that's down. so kind of... what, so what, what's his name? So that's uh, Jamie Webster and We Get By. Is okay, the album. I'll be checking that out. Oh, Marvelous. Okay, so, yeah, that's me this week. Okay, well for me, um, I I have not I have not been well, I have been playing, but. Um, I picked up Metal Gear Solid Five again. All right, Oodles was talking about it. I watched some di- documentaries on it, and I'm just like, okay, I'll play it again. And thankfully, when you have it on the PC, it saves your progress if you uninstall it. So I didn't have to do the hour and a half long intro again. Yay! <laughs> I had ten minutes of working out how to do the controls again, and then I was good. Oh, can I just say, I actually did enjoy that intro. That set that I enjoyed up. the intro, I but I played, like it. I played it three times. It's a long intro that you can't skip. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And like, uh, because as I kind of briefly, I'll, I'll go into this as a brief dive version, but uh, as I described last week, I only played up to maybe like, I've only ever gotten up to like mission six, or, five or six um, in it. I've started it three times uh, on the PlayStation and then on the PC. Um, and yeah, so it's just, it's one of those ones where I just dropped off to it, but I'm past mission six. So I'm officially as far into the game as I've ever been. <laughs> You're the end of the That's an achievement. I have achieved this week. Um, so what what um what pushed you away from it last time, or was it just like one of those situations where something just distracts you? Uh, yeah, I think something shiny floated specific? in front of my eyes, and I did. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, a blue car. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, piece of candy. Ooh, piece of candy. Like that. Um, yeah, I, I I really can't remember. It was like two years ago, and it was just something else came out. Actually, no, I tell you when it was. It was yeah. when I bought my switch. Oh. Because okay, my yeah. switch was an impulse purchase. I didn't intend to buy one. But like it was like January and I was miserable and like I, I was bored of my games. And I said, like, you know, fuck it, I'm going to go to the shop and I'm going to buy a Switch. And that's why I bought my Switch. And I was playing, I'd started Metal Gear Solid as part of that. I need to do something with my weekends at the yeah. minute. And so, <laughs> yeah, I did like six hours of it and then I went and bought a Switch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the main things I've been doing this week, um, so there's been two things I've been watching. First of all, first one was um, Summer Games Done Quick, SGDQ. Mm. Uh, which is something I love speedrunning. I can't speedrun. I've never tried to speedrun. It looks like it would drive me away from gaming, but I enjoy watching it. Um, and I didn't get to watch a lot of it this week because I've been had a hellish week with work. Um, but I did watch a few of them. Some of them were spectacular. Um, watching someone do the uh, Horizon Zero Dawn DLC for the Frozen Wilds in 50 minutes was ludicrous because when I did that, it took me like 
15 hours or something stupid like that but it's an open world game and i don't i I, it always baffles me how people can do open world games really quickly when you've got like miles to traverse (laughs) yeah like most of the time simply just going to be running to get there (laughs) exactly and to be fair that's what most of his speed run was it was running from place to place when he got to where he needed to go he was done in seconds Mm. like combat wise it was he was perfect it was spot on it was brilliant to watch um mario odyssey in just over an hour um that was good that was the 125 moons one so uh they call it world peace that category uh, so it's not like doing the whole game and like the dark side of the moon stuff at the end or getting all of 500 moons, but 120, basically clocking the story. Yeah, yeah. Just over an hour. Um, <laughs> and, I, mean, I mean, Bloodborne in under an hour and a half is always entertaining to watch. Oh, yeah. I remember, I've not watched much of the uh, the uh, Games Done Quick stuff, but I remember uh, a year or two ago, or probably like two or three years ago, I saw a Bloodborne streamer do, I think it was an all-boss run in about an hour and 40 minutes yeah and it was just incredible yeah well that's what that's what they did this time and they've managed to get the time down to 117 or something like that was it the guy with the really big beard no it was a different guy but another one you talk about that was Hayes Hayes UCS Toast and that was one of the most legendary runs because the guy that was when obviously with this year with it being COVID it was done online it wasn't done in the auditorium they didn't have people sat behind them but when Zeus Mm. did that run that was SG no that was AGDQ 2017 2018 uh yeah so two years ago yeah. uh when he did that one like he had his like couch crew behind him who normally help commentate like there's bits where the runners will end up having to like really concentrate on something so they don't commentate now nah, toast yeah. was toast didn't stop speaking throughout the whole thing yeah yeah and he's yeah. really engaging to listen to and the the funniest part was he, he screws up the um the father gascoigne fight so like three yeah. minutes into the run or something stupid like that the very first boss <laughs> And he screws it up, and he, he dies, and he comes, and he's going back, and he's, and he's just, he's mad. Miyazaki's hitting the meme button. I'm getting memed in and out. This guy's not doing what I want him to do. Oh man, it sucks. I'm here at AG and stuff like that. And he's going mad, but he's very funny and engaging with it. It's a legendary thing. If you do anything on YouTube in the next week, look up Jesus here's toast running um, Bloodborne a couple of years ago because it was just yeah. brilliant. One of the best things I've ever seen. But yeah, I love SGDQ. Oh, um, Stick? Sorry. <laughs> I, uh, sorry, no, I didn't want to interrupt. I just want to say that I find it absolutely crazy that someone can do Bloodborne in that mm. short amount of time. Yeah. yeah. It, it took me longer than that just to get Same around here. the first corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, if it, so <clears throat> I'm pretty good at the first half of Bloodborne just because I've played it a load of times. I can normally get to Vicar Amelia in just under an hour. Um and get beyond that. Then I slow down after that. It's basically the bits I've played the most. He yeah. got the runner yesterday got to Father Gascoigne in three minutes and thirty seconds. And that includes Did kind just... of like spawn spawning in, getting your first weapons, getting out of the dream, uh finding the first lamp, getting through everything <laughs> and all that. Yeah. And they don't use that many glitches either. There's the the only glitches they use are um Quit, uh, I think they call them quit out glitches, which is where you basically you jump off something and you ju- you quit out of the game just before you hit the death plane. And when it reloads, yeah. it pushes you a little bit further. So there's not much in the way of sequence breaking or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it was all bosses in an hour 17, and that's including the DLC bosses as well. <laughs> he killed Orphan of Cos before Orphan of Cos could do- finish the animation to go into a second phase. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. Yeah, and it's all just about abusing the mechanics within the game. That's what ninety nine percent of those speed runs are as well. Um, yeah. And I'm going to be going back and watching a lot of the runs um, on the YouTube vods. The one I'm really interested in because I know they've run it before, but I haven't seen it. Um, and and Oodles will probably shit himself when he hears this one. Um, but The Witcher three in under three hours. What? Yeah. How? How? I have no idea. Yeah, I'm so in- flags, <laughs> I'm so interested. In watching. I'm literally tomorrow. I'm going to be working, and I'm going to have like my phone on with it on because I just want to see how he does it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My mind's already blown with that already. Yeah, but yeah. so yeah, it's it's a really good thing. And they raised. Hang on, I'm just looking it up now. They raised two point three million dollars. Bloody hell! Over the space of a week, 
And that's a low year because obviously people are, you know, with the whole COVID thing going on, people weren't there to hype up and people don't have as much money at the yeah. minute and stuff like that. That's a really ridiculous number um, for Doctors Without Borders. So mm. it's astounding what they do. And I'm really, I support it every year. I either give money or I buy a t-shirt or something like that. Um, really, really good charity and really, really good event. And you find so much content that you can kind of pop on you know, throughout the year that I follow a load of speedruns yeah. on Twitch now. So definitely worth looking at. If you go into YouTube and look up some of the VODs, it's just nuts. And they've probably, they play something like 200 games over the week. There'll be something that you want to watch. Yeah. Um, and very briefly, the other thing that I've been uh, watching is what we do in the shadows. Oh, so good. I saw the so film good. years ago. And I love the film. And I love Jermaine Clement and Taika Waititi and all those lads. I loved Flight of the Concords. You know, that is my humour. I, I love the kind of the fake mockumentary thing. And I knew they'd done a TV series, but I'd never gotten around to seeing it. Um, and me and my girlfriend, we were just bored the other day and we were just flicking through iPlayers. Oh, what are we doing in the shadows? And they're like, hang on, it's got Matt Berry in it and I haven't watched it. What? <laughs> mm. I didn't know that. Uh, well, I've not seen the movie, but I didn't know the series had Matt Berry. Oh, yes. I intend to watch the film and now I definitely intend to watch the series. He he is Matt Berry doing his Matt Berry best, basically. He, yep. As with every role in his existence as an actor, he is just yeah. playing Matt Berry. <laughs> I've not seen any of it. He's so wonderful. It sounds uh, like a good recommendation. So, uh, for those who don't, for those who don't know about it, what we do in the shadows, it's a mockumentary about a collection of vampires living together in a house in Staten Island in New York. They have their human familiar Guillermo. Um, who is basically their dog's body. He wants to become a vampire, and he's kind of loving the lifestyle of the vampires, but they kind of disrespect him. Uh, there's four of them living together. Um, one, one of them's played by Kevan Novak, who you might remember from Phone Jacker years ago on Channel 4. Mm. Oh, God, that's going back. <laughs> yeah, That is going back. Yeah. It was a deep cut. It, it <laughs> took me four episodes to work out who he was. Yeah. <laughs> um, you got Matt Berry. Um, I can't remember the actress who plays Nadja. And uh, there was an American one called... Uh, he was an energy vampire. And I love the concept of him. Um, so yes. Colin Robinson, always referred to by his full name as well. Never just Colin. He's always Colin <laughs> Robinson when he walks into a room. He, um, as an energy vampire... He is one of the more common vampires, and apparently you will probably know one. He feeds off the energy of others, and but to do that, he either makes them angry or he bores them. <laughs> so he is a very grey, drab man, middle-aged, works in an office, and he just goes goes up to people and he sp speaks to them in a very soft voice like this and, tell, and talks to them about, oh, did you know about printer ink? And, <laughs> oh, it's not the same kind of tea that they have in China because in China they do tea like that. And stuff like that, you know, it's like really mundane shit. Yeah. And as he's talking to them, you see them just kind of kind of nodding <laughs> and off like that. And he's like... <laughs> or, there's, a great, there's a great one where he goes to a town council meeting and he he plants something that causes someone to, like erupt in anger which then makes the entire council ang angry which makes everyone in the room angry and he sat there his eyes are glowing blue he's just like ah, 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 like that the same it, he's got this he's got this great facial expression hasn't he when when he when he's really happy stuff's kicking off around him and he just looks directly into the camera and he's just his eyes glow yeah and he just grin and he just grins and he's just like he like he's just getting off on all of this because that's what he does that's what happens he doesn't need blood he just needs to, the energy from people yeah it's, it's so good it's yeah it's so it's so well put together and just even though it's an american show because it's made for i think I, I think it's made for hbo i might be wrong on no fx fx maker um and it's kind of cool made by the bbc it's really british humor so you'll have characters calling each other assholes <laughs> rather than assholes yeah. and stuff like that it's, it's um <laughs> yeah, and um, Matt Berry just talking about tits constantly, which is, for some reason, is the funniest thing in the world to me. Um, and the guest stars, they have so many good guest stars in it. Uh, Mark Hamill's in an episode. They got fucking Luke oh. Skywalker into it, doing his best Joker <laughs> that, voice. Yeah. That episode is... Have you watched all of it, then? I have three no. episodes to watch of the second season, but I'm, that, that's the last episode I watched. The one with Mark Hamill. The last the episode with Mark Hamill in is so good. Jackie Daytona yeah. is 
And, and the... Can I just show you something to, before yeah. I, I don't want to interrupt you quickly? On my wall behind me, sorry for the noise, I have uh, just people at home, uh, what, you know, listening won't see this, but I have this little Jackie Daytona <laughs> poster. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they, uh, they get Tilda Swinton. They like take away Titi guests in it. Um, uh, Wesley Snipes is in oh, wow. it. Quite Evan diverse. Rachel Wood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. basically. Um, oh, what's it? He's in, he does one of the voices in Big Mouth. And um, is it Nick Kroll? Oh, Nick Kroll. Yeah. Who yeah, plays yeah. Who plays Simon the Nefarious? <laughs> um, yeah. There's just so many like randomly really famous guest stars in it, and it is so well done and so perfectly pitched. Everything is the right amount of silly and stupid to get away with the concept. Um, it's one. It's a wonderful show. I really recommend anybody watch that. And it's all, it's on the iPlayer. All twenty episodes are on the iPlayer if you're in the UK. Yeah. So get on it and really watch that one. And that the, they're also the twenty minute episodes, so you can binge through the whole series in a week. The whole two series in a weekend. Cool. Like it doesn't take you long to go through, but you you will die laughing. It is so, so funny in place. And it's, it's even just little silly stuff like for um, for Laszlo, um, Matt Berry's character, the only way he can trans, transfig- transfigurate into a bat is by shouting, BAT! at the top of his voice. <laughs> yeah. And then when he comes out of his human form! <laughs> Every single so time. Oh, cool. Or the... Um, yeah. Or De- you know, dealing with... Were- having a fight with werewolves and winning by using a chew toy and stuff like that. And- <laughs> Yeah. Really, really well Just done. Daft. So, yeah, but yep. perfectly pitched daft, mm. like perfect for their world. Daft, not silly for the sake of it. It everything fits into their context. I, I just want to say, um, if you are going to watch the series, I would recommend watching the film first. Not because you have to see it or anything, but I, you'll get a few of the those references. Char- yeah. Th- those, yeah, they get the references, and some of those characters do pop up. So I would recommend, and the, and the, and you know the, the the film is Taika Waititi and Jermaine, Jermaine Clement. It's the Fight of the Concords. Yeah. So like, if you're into that, then where's you, the you know, movie? Is it on uh, like Netflix or film. Prime at the moment? Any, anyone got any ideas? I'll track it down, but just in um, case anyone knows, it definitely was on I, Netflix. It's uh, I don't know if it still is. Yeah, it wasn't. It, it might be on Netflix. Though. I have yeah, no idea. Have I, um, but to be, to be to be fair, people could come back and listen to this a year later and have no idea whether it's on Netflix or not because everything changes. I was actually so asking for myself. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wonder. It might actually. It, it could be on the iPlayer. Don't quote me on that, but I think it might. It was at one time on the iPlayer. So just 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 Google where to watch. What we do in yeah. the shadows okay. in your yeah. country. I mean, it, it's well worth the rental price anyway from Amazon. Oh, absolutely. So. Yeah, one of the funny, one of the funniest films I've seen for a very long time, and now one of the funniest yep. TV series I've seen for a long time. Yes, apart from the fact my girlfriend can't stop impersonating Nadja now. She, uh, <laughs> she, 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 she's that a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, when she walks around going, he speaks of the bullshit in that voice and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So right, okay, so that was the Nexus. We may have rambled on for far too long, but it was a marvelous rambling. Oh yes, and. You know, if we're going to be wasting time, we shall be wasting time marvellously. Okay, so before we go on any further into the uh, main topic of modern escapism that we're, just, uh, we're going to discuss today, we did want to extend a really heartfelt thank you to uh, our friends in the computer game show. Uh, the guys were really nice about helping spread the word about modern escapism when our first episode dropped. Uh, in case you don't know, we met on their Discord Um and we've been fans of their show. And all of us, bar, I think like not all of us are up there Patreon supporters. We owe them a great debt because we listen to them week in, week out. They provide us with a lot of feed, uh, a lot of entertainment for, for free. I know we end up get, we give them money by our own volition, but you know they provide a lot of entertainment to us for free. Mm. And for them to give us a bit of a leg up and getting started, it was really massively appreciated. So you know, to David, Sean, Matt and James, thank you very much. And thank you very much for everything that you do and for the community that you have. If you didn't have that, we wouldn't have met. And, you know, in the future, we're very, you know, we're very open to, you know, letting you into our giant juggernaut of a podcast that's (laughs) going to come on. You can come into our network, into the Modern Escapism (laughs) Network. I mean, it's just inevitable, isn't it? Thanks, (laughs) guys. Yeah, thank you, chaps. (laughs) Yes, thank you very much. Much it was really appreciated. Thank you very much. Yeah, seriously, thanks, guys. So we're going to move into 
our main topic of discussion today. And this is a this is weird. I decided to go for very complicated. I pitched this idea. This is going to be a really complicated one because the more I've thought about it, the more I've had. I've, I've had to kind of explain this one a few times, but I do think it's something that's worthwhile talking about. So as we move into into modern modern times, we find that a lot of our media is digital. The idea of owning CDs and owning DVDs, Blu-rays, games on discs, he says, punching his microphone, <laughs> has kind of gone out the window in favour of streaming. Um, so we're going to start off this particular bit of the discussion before we, I get, I lean us into the main bit of it. And what I want to talk about is, what is your preference? Do you prefer to buy your content, be it books, games, films, music? Do you prefer digital over physical? And do you prefer to buy stuff or stream stuff? Stig, take us away. Um, I have a bit of a mixture with this one. Uh, films, I will buy physical. Uh, if it's something I really love, or if it's like a collection of stuff. So I have the full Studio Ghibli collection on physical. Oh, you beauty. I have all, I have all the MCU films. I have every single Pixar and Disney classic film on physical. I know now you can get them on Disney Plus, but I started that collection a long time ago before Disney Plus was a, a pipe dream, you know. Yeah. You know, before anyone even thought about streaming, I started that. Um, but we have a lot of DVDs and Blu-rays, and over the years we've kind of got rid of some because we realised actually we don't really watch that anymore. Or we've outgrown that kind of film. Um, some stuff we bought when I was, you know, sixteen, seventeen things like that um but i tend to like to have my films on physical uh, i still stream i have netflix i have amazon i have disney plus um so i do stream stuff but if it's something i really love i want a physical copy i want to be able to know that i can just go and get that film whenever i want put it into the, the uh, my ps4 and watch it um and but when it comes to music, I gave up on CDs a long time ago. We have a box of CDs, me and my wife, which is just kind of shoved to the side that we are constantly talking about what do we do with this? Do we try and sell them on something like Music Magpie or, or just get rid of it or just take it to the charity shop? We have gone full digital with music. Uh, books, I've pretty much gone full digital on. Um, I... There's a couple of books that I've bought because it completes a collection. Being being a, a bit of an OCD on it, that's like, well, somebody bought me this book yeah. physically, so I must get the next one and the next one physically because otherwise it doesn't make sense to just have one sat on your shelf. Yes, but yes but if, is... if you if you do that, though, you know you will get a series of seven books and they will change the spine design for one of them. <laughs> yes. Just to annoy yeah, yeah, you. Just... Well, well, the buddy MCU films do that. You have all the all the age rate or age um ratings all in the line and then all of a sudden one will be at the top of the spine. Yeah. Just like, why have you done that? Why why have you done that? <laughs> like it just looks But yes, um so I've it's a bit of a mixture, but I you know, I'm not games I I buy single player games, I buy physical every single time because I don't really replay a lot of games. Um I just start off the time it's when I've got other games to play to replay something. Yeah, I think in the last twenty or so years, I've replayed Half Life Two, Metal Gear Solid One, Metal Gear Solid Three, and Greece. And Greece was digital anyway. So you're talking four games in the last twenty years I've replayed. So a single player game, I'll buy it, I'll play it, I'll trade it in. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very much like like that with you. Like I was going to buy. Um... The Last of Us 2 on digital. And then I thought, hang on, is that a game I will ever play again when I finish it? Cause, and I probably would. I haven't even finished it yet, but it's not a game that I'll want to play again. No, I, I, I really like that. I, you know, It's a, a fantastic game, I, but I'll never play it again. I know I never will, so it'll just sit in my cupboard just gathering dust. So I might as well play it, just trade it in. It cost me, you know probably 14 quid with the money that i got back yeah, yeah. so yeah what about what about you kieran what's your what's your thoughts on on um which format to get well when we're talking about games um i'm mostly digital um 
it's a really good point uh, Stig raised about replayability. Well, not replayability, but the fact of, or not whether you'll replay a game. Because um, I think for the most part, I wouldn't. However, I do still buy the majority of my stuff digitally, though the reason for that is probably just like impulse and impatience. It's I, I've decided <laughs> I want this and now I want it now. So <laughs> especially it's uh, bad, especially with uh, Switch games, because usually it's right. That's 50 quid. Yeah. For something I'm going to play once. A classic example being uh, the Link's Awakening remake. I think that was 50 quid like when it came out digitally and yeah, played that once. Not going to play that again. Um, yeah, that was the, that was one I especially bought physical because I knew especially with Switch games holding their their value on cartridge as well. Like yeah. I bought that for I think I, tra- I made profit on that because I traded in a couple of games against it and I got it for like £32 and I sold it a week later for 42 Oh, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. Can't go wrong yeah. there. And I cleared some space on my shelf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so what, I, what I did recently was get out uh, my physical games that I own from the, I guess, the current generation, but it's uh, PS4 and Switch. Yeah. And, you know, I've got tons of games, but digitally I have 13. Uh, sorry, <laughs> hard copy, I have 13. Sorry, oh, right. That's good. Uh, but, and four of them are Souls games. Well, yeah, not going to argue with that. Yeah. But yeah, for, for when we're talking games, I'm, I'm absolutely majority digital and uh, yeah, imagine I'll continue to be really. Yeah, the um, my I mean my attitudes towards, especially when it came to gaming, changed a while ago. I used to love getting big box collectors editions of games. Mm. I had loads of them. I had the Bloodborne Nightmare edition, which was beautiful. Um, Did that come and... with like a ginormous figure or something? No, no, that, that that was the one that came with um, a, a quill and blood red ink set. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and uh, it, it also came with the bell, um, the Bell of Awakening. Yeah, uh, yeah it was great. It, the The box it came in also looked, the tin looked like uh, books on a bookshelf. Mm. Marvellous thing. I, I, but I saw that last year. Um, I, I had stuff like the Overwatch collector's edition, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, speaking and of um, it, collector's editions... Uh, I saw an article today, actually, which was really quite apt. It's um, uh, it's real in the UK. Xbox collectors editions are no longer to come going to come with the actual disc. Oh, don't start me on that one. I've been pissed off about that one for years since the Battlefield <laughs> One started that trend. I've been well pissed off about that. But that that is a big diversion that I will rant about on a future episode <laughs> of Modernist Games. And trust me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I used to collect the collector's editions, and then it was it wasn't until I moved into a quite small flat, and half of my spare room was taken up by this pile of boxes of games that I didn't take out the packaging because I wanted them to be worth something. Where it actually probably ended up buying the game digitally mm. or in like a, a standard edition later on. And I thought, what am I doing with these? They're sitting collecting dust. Um, and I, I had a big clear out last year. I sold all my CDs. Oof. I have five CDs now. One of them I produced. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the only reason I've kept it because it's got my name written on the back of it. Um, and the, 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 one of the other ones is that amazing version of um, it was a special edition of. 10,000 Days by Tool, where you had these two lenses on it and you got like 3D artwork. Yeah. No way in hell am I selling that. Something <laughs> that cool. Cool, in quotes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, same with music. I'm on Spotify. I, so, I, so I don't own CDs. I have a handful of Blu rays for Spirited Away his, and Ghost in the Shell and stuff like that. Like stuff that where it is beautiful in 4K and I don't ever, uh, in 4K and I don't want to ever lose it. Hmm. Books. Books are always physical because reading ebooks hurts my eyes. And tapping a screen is not the same as turning a page. Yeah. There's a smell to a book. A book for me is an experience. Yeah. You hold it, you correct. The best books are the ones that are dog eared that you've read over and over again. My my copy of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is falling to bits. And I love Spine it. Spine taped together, <laughs> some of the sections in the wrong order. Yeah, absolutely. And even, I'll read them in the wrong order, and it's still fine. I still know what happens. Biggie, what's your thoughts on it? Uh, well, yeah, I was just thinking, um, talking about um, books. I haven't read a book generally in years. I read uh, comics on my phone just because of time. Uh, yeah. I just don't feel like I have time to uh, read a book. But I do subscribe to something we haven't talked about, and that's some magazines. 
Ooh. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, mm. I subscribe to Retro Gamer, and it's the only magazine I get. I used to get Empire, Total Film, Official PlayStation Magazine, uh, Retro Gamer, oh. and a few other movie, uh, th- a few other magazines that I used to get. But they've all gone, and now, I, uh, for me, I buy them. Um, I just literally have Retro Gamer now. That's it, because I still like having a magazine to read yeah i think i think the internet kind of killed off most magazines for me yep. yeah um because magazines you're always getting news that's two months late really yep, effectively because yep. of publishing cycles like i i subscribed to official playstation magazine when i was a kid yeah, and yeah. i it basically used to wind up that i would have at least two new magazines a week just because of all the different subscriptions that i had um whether it, whether it was the early 2000s of being a teenager and getting lads mags admit it we all did it um or the uh, playstation magazine pc gamer stuff like that uh, i used to get but there was basically there's something new every every week i would read and then i'd be you know i'd read kerrang because yeah. of course why not of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah magazines you used to get magazines. free stuff for them so you used to get free stuff for them didn't you like you actually got physical media with them to yeah kerrang occasionally you'd yeah. get a cd with like and like some album tracks of big artists, but nothing that you actually recognized, but it was just artists that you knew of. Mm. It's like, oh, here's track 11 off the CD or something like that. Uh, PlayStation Magazine, obviously, the demos, demo discs, yeah. Yeah. wonderful, wonderful yeah. things. Yeah. You, you expanded the amount of time you got on your PlayStation because you could play demo discs when you were too young and poor to go out and buy new games every week. <laughs> yeah. And, and some would be like, I don't know a certain part of the game that you could just repeatedly play and really enjoy and get better at, and you know it, it was just those some of those demos went on for ages. The um the, the Grand Theft Auto demo on the official PlayStation magazine it was like one of their really early demo discs. The first Grand Theft Auto, you you basically you had the entire map, but the game the demo timed out after twelve minutes or something like that. Mm. Uh, so me and my little brother would always race to see how far into the map we could get in ten minutes, <laughs> and then when we got bored of that one, it was basically how higher score can we get we didn't do any missions or anything we just tear arsed around yeah was it liberty city in that one but yeah well, i've got <laughs> a very vivid memory of um you know buying a physical copy of a game and it was the original grand theft auto big box pc version oh, along with uh, command and conquer red alert uh, nice and that oh those were the days oh yeah those were the days my lad the, the feeling of going and buying one of those massive pc uh game boxes and um the, like getting Doom and Duke Nukem 3D are two like really fond memories of as well, but you know yeah. those a disadvantage of the physical media, especially in that form, is the boxes just disintegrate. There was also no yeah. need for them to be that big. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think one Christmas I got the Half Life Game of the Year edition, and it came with opposing force, and it was this whacking great big thing like a cereal with- box. <laughs> <laughs> two cereal, basically two cereal boxes stapled together, and inside you opened up, and there's a jewel case for each one, just a normal CD case. Like, why does it need to be so big? Why do we need this? Yeah. And I kept that box for ages. Eventually, disintegrated. I still have though those original two discs somewhere in the loft. Um, but so the reason why I wanted to talk about this, and you know, we have our preferences on there. Um, whether it comes to games, books, or whatever, do we actually own digital content? And that's a question that it's been posed a lot of times, and there's a lot of there's academics talking about this. As to to what degree do you do you own the content that you buy or you consume these days? Mm. And I'm not talking about like having a Netflix subscription or a Spotify subscription. That is quite obviously your those are streaming services. So you know that content can be removed from them at any point. We've seen we've seen people crying on Reddit that the office is moving to a different provider, <laughs> yeah, and that people will have to change their routine. Um, or we've seen that you know artists have decided that Spotify isn't paying them enough per song, uh, per stream of a song. So it's just like, right, no, fuck it, we'll go off to. Is it Tidal? I think that the one that Jay Z oh, set yeah, up, yeah, Tidal. which was supposed to have a better share. Or we'll go to Apple Music or whatever like that. All these things are very, fairly anti-consumer, but also anti-provider. You know, like the artists, the content creators, they make out of it bad. We make out of it bad. The platform holder makes out of it good, effectively. Mm-hmm. But we know that that's what's happening. But when you buy a film on Amazon, uh, inst- Prime Instant Video, yeah? Not rent it, buy it. Mm. You, you go on, you see what we do in the shadows. You think, oh, I can rent that for three quid. Or oh, it's only a fiver and buy it and it goes into my library. Is that yours? 
And I want to I, I want to po- point out some something, something that I found on an article that, uh, from the Atlantic, and I'll make sure the link is in the show notes. Um, it's just this quote quote here, and this is actually about Amazon Kindle, but it kind of applies to what the point I'm trying to make. Mm. If Amazon were to go out of business, all of my Kindle books would be inaccessible because Kindle books are tethered to Kindle software, an analyst said. An analyst whose name I can't pronounce, I won't try, I'll offend them. Yeah. It's fine. Um, but the link will be in the description. He, um, he suspects that if Amazon were to go under, hackers would quickly figure out how to unlock the Kindle format and hopefully salvage materials, PDFs, or plain text the right way. It might end up liberating that content, which of course would drive publishers crazy. So... But it's the, the idea that of Amazon changing or disappearing from the marketplace, and it seems like a very unlikely thing given the juggernaut they are, but if they decide to, if they decide to sack off the Kindle store, you lose all your books. If they decide to sack off the Prime Video thing, you lose all your films. It feels at the minute, and there is actually a lawsuit going through in America, someone's filed a class, a class action thing, because there is a point the terms and conditions, and it's one of these hidden things on page 89 that no one ever reads down to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazon can take, Amazon reserve the right to take content from your library that you have paid for to own if they see fit or if they remove from the platform for whatever reason. Okay, the, if they see fit, that's a, that's a concerning phrasing, isn't that, it? Yeah, but the, um, the example that was cited was the person who, was, who um, there was a Reddit post where someone had a Halloween playlist of films, you know, horror films to watch it over Halloween. And one of them was uh, Pontypool. I think it's a horror film. I haven't seen, I haven't sure seen it, but I've heard about it. He says knocking his mic stand again. <laughs> um, but basically, one year they went to watch it for Halloween, and it was gone. No record of them ever owning it, contacting Amazon. Amazon had no record of them ever owning it. It was as if they'd never bought it, but they have a distinct memory of watching it every year as part of this playlist of films. Yeah. And it was Amazon that just pulled it from their library. No refund. Nothing like that. So... What are your thoughts on kind of how how do we exercise ownership over the things that we buy, especially when it's marked as a buy to keep rather than a buy to rent? Biggie. I mean, it's slightly different, possibly a different situation to yourselves. Whereas going back to what Kieran was saying, um, I buy all my games digitally. I'm just looking across at my shelf right now, and I haven't got a single PS4 game physically. They've all gone. They've been traded in for. Um, PSN wallet and basically I have a sharing account with one of my besties so my PS4 is registered on his as his primary and his PS4 is registered on mine as a primary and we share our accounts so we share the games that we buy um, and do it that way so if he buys one game I can play exactly the same game on mine it doesn't matter if they're online, yeah. offline. It, it it's all good. It all works. So yeah, I've heard a few people do. We that. went down that route a long time ago. We started it on the PS3 when we realised you could do that, and we've been doing it into this generation. So when I referred to uh, my backlog on my, the last show, uh, yeah, my backlog goes back to my PS3 days. So I've got a lot of digital content that I'm happy to have there to go back and play at some point whenever I wish to. But there is that danger that it might suddenly not be there. But I seem to be currently yeah. prepared to have that as a risk. As long as I'm able to play the games whenever I feel fit at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, so is that so, like um if certain games are online only even though there's actually no like online experience? Is, is that is what you it, mean uh, when you mean, like, play things as you see? Yeah, it? exactly. I mean, that, that is a danger, isn't it? Because even if you have the physical copy or a digital copy, if the servers go down, a classic example, uh, a favourite game of mine, The Division, is online based. Mm. So if they take that down, that game is unplayable, either whether you have the game or not, uh, in a physical uh, version. So yeah, it, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? The type of game you're interested in, mm. the game that you want to play, uh, yeah, it does happen. Uh, what is it? Um, Drive Club on the PlayStation 4. They uh, shut that down. You can only play that single player on your own. You can't play it online. You can't play against other people in any way or format. It is just literally, they took it from the store. So you can't buy it if you want to now. But if you have bought it, you can re download it. Um, I read somewhere that SingStar has disappeared off the PS3 store completely. 
people can't even, can't yeah, even it has. download that if they own it as PS3, but if you have it on the PS4, whatever version it is, I think you're okay for the moment. So I think that one was a rights issue with the licensing with the music used in it. Which, um, I mean, that's happened a few times because that happened to uh, Alan Wake. Alan Wake disappeared from Steam and from the Xbox store for a while because the um, some of the licensed music in it ran out of license, effectively. Mm. And they had to pull it from the store to the point where you couldn't re-download it. There was a rush to actually... It shot up in the charts because everybody down, everyone who had it in the Steam library downloaded it again so yeah. they could um, because it was a rights issue, which meant you couldn't resubscribe to it. Um, and there is history with gaming. There's a lot of history that's happening. EA are fucking mm. awful for it. Um, I found a big list, which I'm not going to read out all of it because <laughs> God knows it's like 400 games. Um, but like big games where... And actually... In the rather unstructured form of this conversation and this podcast, it gets me on to a point about not only ownership of the full product, so like films being taken away from you, or when Microsoft shut down the Microsoft Bookstore on as part of the Zune platform. I think it was the Zune platform. So uh, Microsoft was selling ebooks in competition with Amazon. At one point last year, they shut that down, and everyone's ebooks just disappeared. No compensation, none of that. It's just poof. Gone. Oh, wow. I didn't even know that that was a thing. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, it was last year. It caused a big stink, and Microsoft had no real way to apologize for it. They just shut the service down and says you've got like six months to read all your books, and then they're poof gone, yeah. and they went. Uh, you could and you couldn't transfer them to another service or anything like that. Or down, they were in a proprietary format as well, so you, it's not like you could download a PDF of it and keep mm. it or anything like that. It was awful. Um, Stiggy. Yes, yeah, so this is kind of why I stick with physical for my favorite stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, my favorite books is my favorite books are physical. My favorite films are physical, and I know. Um, sorry to get ahead of ourselves with you know the, the listener feedback here, but one of our uh, listeners, Aaron uh, Murren Heath, has, has said um, that he thinks that physical media is essentially tying your license into temporary technology. So whilst yes, uh, a service like Microsoft can just pull your books, or Amazon can pull your your um digital library physical yes you do have a copy of your film but what happens if they stop making blu-ray players and just say it's an old technology you can't really buy vhs players these days can you probably Um, like very special specialists can because the only how many how many cars these days comes with a cd player Mine did, but mine's from twenty sixteen. Uh, <laughs> my, I mean, my car is from my car's from twenty thirteen. Doesn't have a CD player. Yeah, it's like so. So the point I'm really getting at is that that I prefer to have these physical because I want ownership. I want the ability to know that if I ever want to sit and watch a Disney film, or if I ever want to watch Die Hard again, I'm not at the mercy at whatever the distributor once yeah well just to the, counter like, that I, don't, I totally agree where you're coming from um i'm looking up on my shelf and i don't know about you guys but i went from having a horrendous dvd collection to then going upgrade into blu-rays but then i just got to a point where i just thought i can't do it i just can't get blu-rays for every movie that i ever wanted and i've suddenly reduced it down to what i would call in my obviously my own personal opinion movies that i like that i want to collect so yes, I've got Lord of the Rings up there. I've got Star Wars, you know, certain movies that I feel deserve to have that Blu-ray experience. But then they brought out 4K, and I'm just like, no, I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> like, I'm not, and I won't. I refuse. Yeah. And then you've now got streaming services, and it, it just, I, I hardly touch my Blu-rays up there. I can easily watch something with, you know, pretty decent quality with Blu-ray. Uh, sorry, with Netflix or Amazon. And quite easily sit there and watch the movie and enjoy it if it pops up. So I don't need to put my Blu-ray in because it's there. But I, I just haven't touched my Blu-ray collection apart from watching the thing the other night. And that was it. And I, I would agree with that. Uh, I have not touched a lot of films from our Blu-ray other than my daughter wanting to watch Harry Potter films over and over again. Um, but yeah, in general, I just like to know that I've got it. I yeah. don't want the risk. I don't want that risk of, oh, I own. Die Hard. Like, I'm going to use Die Hard because it's my favourite film. Disney owned the rights to Die Hard. 
right? Because they bought all of Fox and everything. If, but if Disney all of a sudden decide, actually, we don't want all these eighteen films, we don't want these eighty, you know, these, we don't want to distribute them anywhere, and they decide to pull them all, what, what, what do you do mm. then? Yeah. Like, where do I go then to watch my favorite films? And yes, as um, Aaron said here, that you're you're kind of fighting against all technology. Like as Biggie said, it's gone from DVD to Blu-ray to 4K. It keeps going up. You know, you, you your Blu-rays are going to become outdated at some point. I, just for the time being, for me personally, I want to be able to know that I own that film and I can access that film. Yeah. No. I'm... And same with books. Yeah. Like, if I ever decide I want to read my favorite book again, I can. I don't have to worry about it falling off my Kindle. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Kieran, so, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I'm f- for the v- vast majority digital when it comes to films as well and like and TV as well. Um, but funnily enough, fairly recently there was a film that I, I su- suddenly got the urge. I really want to watch this, and uh, it was the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Brilliant film. Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in the title. Spoiler in the title. <laughs> Um, yeah, but um, yeah, I owned that on DVD. I had a quick look on some streaming platforms and couldn't find it anywhere. But it's like, oh yeah, I actually own that. It's been so long since I've gone and actually got a DVD off the shelf and watched it that it seemed a bit weird. But yeah, it's a good example of um, I own this. I can actually watch it. Were it because it's not on any uh, streaming platforms? If I didn't own it, I would, I'd be shit out of luck. I'd probably have to go buy I it again. Totally get that. Yeah, I, I remember. My girlfriend wanted to watch Spirited Away um, because she'd never seen any of the Studio Ghibli films. Mm. How someone gets to nearly 30 years old and never watches Ghibli films is beyond me, but nobody's perfect, you know. Yeah. Um, so I said, okay, well, I have Spirited Away. And I, w- I went to my shelf to get the Blu-ray off. And go, You're going to love this film, I'm saying to her. I go towards the PlayStation. And she's flicking around and says, oh, it's on Netflix. Do you want to put it on Netflix? <laughs> literally wasted steps i have wasted calories doing this but but netflix could sorry. take that netflix could take that away and i own that mm. i have that disc i will always have that film yes and it also took god knows how long for studio ghibli films to actually become street on, on a well true come on yeah. a stream but like they, they were yeah. not there anywhere for so long and then netflix acquired them but as you say what happens if that licensing runs out and Netflix go, actually, we don't want to renew that. Yeah. Studio Ghibli is just lost to a whole load of people. Yeah. It's it's a really difficult one to define. Yes. Because yeah. not only are you competing against the on-running march of technology, you're competing against money men who, who, who they are effectively the ones who decide where the content goes. Because hosting stuff online costs money. You know, they, mm. Disney will probably quite happily host Die Hard because they know people will nostalgically watch Die Hard. Die Hard 5 might not be on streaming platforms because <laughs> no bugger will watch it. <laughs> you know? And it's, it, it's one of those things that I find it very difficult to elucidate how I think on this one because I agree with both sides of the argument. I like owning physical media. I think it's a nice thing. I like holding things in my hands, mm. but I don't like the space it takes up. And I had a huge clear out last year. So a load of stuff, so a load of CDs, DVDs, books, that kind of thing. And my life was less cluttered. I Marie Kondo the shit out of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but at the same time, I kind of miss having a... And maybe it's with me being a 90s kid. I miss having a huge tower of CDs. Yeah, I've still I not been able to get yeah. rid of mine yet. I've still got a couple of hundred on uh, some shelves that I yeah. just can't bear to part with. Yeah, I, I, I miss you know down the CDs. Oh, there we go. There's Dream Theater again. Let's listen to that. <laughs> or you know something like that. Yeah, a lot of people um, are naturally hoarders though. You know, oh, in yeah. my garage, yeah. I've got boxes of PlayStation One games, PlayStation Two. I haven't got rid of them. I've kept them. I'm a bit of a retro guy at times, but. <laughs> they're still there. I haven't pulled them out for ages. I know they're there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's there's probably some sort of like philosophical thing down to it, and like giving away these things that have been a, such a big part of you for such a long time means like exactly. you're giving some of yourself away. Yeah, yeah. But 
personally, I just like to think of it. It's mine. I don't want to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think I think that is yeah. the the overriding factors. I have this CD. I have this book. I have this game. It's mine. Yeah. Mm. Mm. No one can take that away from me. The PlayStation might die, and I'll never be able to play it again. But I own the game, <laughs> <laughs> which is like me with Demon Souls. I still have a copy of Demon, physical copy of Demon Souls. I haven't owned a PS3. So there is one other side to this, not about kind of media disappearing or what level of ownership you have, but is media changing? And now this kind of being very conscious that we didn't want to talk a lot about a lot or completely about video gaming on this one, but this one's something that affects it a lot. Um. The idea of media changing, so you buy a game. So, for example, we will talk about Battlefield. You buy Battlefield. It's got a campaign. It's got a multiplayer. You dust through the campaign in, what, eight hours or something like that, and then you spend hours doing the multiplayer. You own that game for years. You're very good at that game. There's been a couple of new Battlefields come out since, but you're not bothered by them because you like this one. This one's your Battlefield game. And then EA... Do that, and the server turns off because there's 400 people playing it in the world and it's not worth their while to keep the server going. You might have got thousands of hours out of this game. You might have become pro level, but all of a sudden that's gone for you. And it's the fact you paid £50, £60 for this game when it first came out, and because of a decision that you have no influence over, your media experience has changed. And it's what I alluded to before. There's this great big list, and EA are awful for it. Uh, I mean, I'm just I'm, I'm looking at uh, things where servers have been turned off. So, you know, a lot of it's like older FIFA games, which, okay, fair enough. The People buy the next FIFA game every year, but some people stay playing the old ones. But even stuff like, like Crisis and Crisis 2, their online servers got taken off. Uh, Neverwinter Nights, that, got, uh, their, that online functionality was taken off. You had games like The Beatles and um, Green Day Rock Bands or Guitar Heroes. They were taken offline completely because of rights issues. Um, or they had songs removed because certain songs needed to be taken off uh, or ran out of their license terms. So how do you feel about this idea that media can change? And it does actually, it does affect TV as well. Um, with the... Primarily with streaming, but I, I'm pretty sure this has happened with things that people have bought where you've had recently with the Black Lives Matter movement and TV shows have been editing out scenes where they've been racially in bad taste. You know, like 30 Rock and the Scrubs removed episodes because there was blackface involved with them. That media then changes or it gets edited or, you know, things get taken out or um, music rights run out in something like Scrubs where music is part of the experience. and But the music rights turn out, so when it hits a streaming service, it's they have to change it and put something else in its place and the media has changed. What are your thoughts on that where media changes? Stig? Um, so a couple of things. Uh, so say for Battlefield, for example, I am... Um, Battlefield 1 is probably it was my first experience of Battlefield. I know it's not a lot of people's favourite one, but I absolutely loved it. I, I thought it was a great, great time. Game. I have, I'd had a great time with my mates uh, who are playing PlayStation 4 with playing Battlefield 1. We often go back to it. We play Battlefield Five, but we often go back to Battlefield One every now and again. I would be very, very sad if they just suddenly turn that off. But I also have come to the conclusion that within maybe a year's time, I'll have a PS Five, and I can't go back and play that anyway. Yeah. So I, there's a point where right now I'd be sad, but I know. The further we go along in time, that just becomes irrelevant anyway. And because it, I've upgraded I've upgraded my technology. Yeah. It's so it's So I've kind of taken that decision away from me as well as EA taking that decision yeah, away from me. It's one of those things that it affects a kind of a vanishingly small amount of people, but it does affect people. And it's yeah. something that I am not sure gets to it, it's something that when it happens, it hits the headlines on like Eurogame or IGN and people go, Oh, this is shit, why are you doing this? It can't cost that much to keep this game going. And it probably does cost money to keep a game going that has four hundred players, but it's it's the fact that it does it does affect things, but it also it just changes the way your media goes. So it, this generation of consoles is apparently going to have some level of backwards compatibility. So it might come to a point where on your PS5 you can play a Battlefield One if you have the disc for it. But, you know, down the line, the multiplayer might get turned off, which is 90% of the appeal of games like that. Yeah. I guess it depends how far along the line it is. If it if if I can play Battlefield 1, 
next year still and a couple of us go yeah let's go play Battlefield because we still jump on Battlefield 4 so you know like we don't I, I downloaded that so I could play with them like we still jump on that yeah. every now and again but I don't know like I, I could there's new ones coming out there isn't a new like film well there is but like there's not going to be my favourite film isn't hopefully touch wood isn't going to get remade so if I can't access that ever that's that's pretty tragic. With games, there's new sequels that usually, you know, nine times out of ten are better. With especially with the online shoes, not always, but I know that there's probably going to be an upgraded version of this series that I'm going to enjoy anyway. Yeah. And at some point, I will just leave that old series behind anyway. Yeah. I'm not going to touch that. And uh, I know Biggie wants to get in with something. I just want to talk quickly about the licensing on music and how that can change your experience. So um, I'm not as much now, but I used to be a big wrestling fan. Yeah. And. Oh, they were all the licensed WWE, tracks on the intro as well. WWE they? used a lot of licensed tracks. And when you go back and watch any of the old stuff and they've had to take that out, it is so noticeable and it ruins the experience so much. There is one pay-per-view from 2005 it was a special ECW one, and they had uh, Enter Sandman as the uh, track they used. Nice. And the character, the Sandman, used it, and it was incredible. If you're a wrestling fan and you watch that, it's goosebumps. It's probably one of the greatest entrances ever. The whole auditorium singing Enter Sandman together while he makes his way through the crowd. Then they lost the rights. <laughs> take that away. You rewatch that on YouTube, and you go, what is this generic... Dum, 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 dum. Like just, it's just generic random crap yeah. that they've put over the top, and you're like, so the experience is just ruined. So yeah, I like it can have a massive effect on how you rewatch stuff that you have a fond memory of when that music is changed. And again, that's it is quite sad that that happens. Yeah, no, I mean, I I, I agree with the um, stick there a lot. I mean, it, it's just, uh, I think. The one thing we've got to remember is that we're all part of this hobby that we all like this part of gaming where, you know, I've come from having an Atari two six hundred to having a PS four, hoping to get a PS five in the future. Technology move moves along and we have to understand that it moves so rapidly in our hobby as well. You know, music may of course adapt over the years, but something about gaming has moved so fast since it came in what in the seventies? I'm gonna say I'm just gonna throw that out there. Yeah. That gaming has just rapidly evolved over, you know, the last thirty, forty years. It's just incredible. And I just think we have to understand that, you know, we can't keep hold of those things that we we do want to play in the past. But like you say, you do get distracted by whatever new is coming. So I think we forget about it quite quickly. But it, it, it I can understand the uproar when people go, Oh no, that's been taken down. And uh, yeah, no, I understand that. But uh, I was just going to mention, just from a, a, a music choice for me, um, I used to, I've got a massive CD collection, but it's all tucked away. Um, I moved yeah. on to Spotify, and that's a game changer for me. Um, I, my music is very, um, mm-hmm. I listen to hip hop more than anything else. Um, and I was stuck in the 90s. All my CD collection was from the 90s. I thought that was the best era, the golden era for hip hop. And that's all I used to listen to. And then now with Spotify, not only can I find the stuff I liked, but I've now found so much, even UK hip hop, which I thought was dead. I've now discovered that it's got a scene that I didn't even realize was potentially bigger than the US now. And I've got Discover Weekly set up so that each week I get a new playlist and it obviously plays tracks of things that I know, but the artists that I've discovered through this is something I would never have done if I was trying to buy a CD in a shop. I just think the way that part of technology has changed for me is a massive plus for music and it has changed my world. Spotify, the fact that I've got it on my phone, my PS4, my laptop, I can listen to it in the car. Just, it's something else for me. Love it. Well, that that kind of thing, and this seems to be a pretty good way to kind of lead off this discussion, is that Spotify for me changed how I interact with music. I used to be a big fan of sticking a CD in, 
and listen to it back to finish as it was intended. And I, I, I love prog music. I'm a nerd. I like, I like to have a calculator open when I listen to an album. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like, but the main thing is I like albums that are concept albums, tell a story. One of my favorite albums of all times, and I know when he hears this, Oodles will probably shit himself because he, lo- I'm sure he loves it as well. Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds. Oh, heck yeah. Absolutely outstanding yeah. album. One of the best ever made. Proggy as all fuck. Tells a story from start to finish and it's beautiful. It's a wonderful album. You can't listen, when, but when I listen to Spotify now, you listen to individual tracks. And I've got Forever Autumn on my playlist, but it sounds a bit, it, it's a bit jarring when you, you listen to, I don't know, a bit of Metallica finishes, and then you go, dong. Yeah, dong. three days. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, got, you got Richard Burton coming out. And it's, um, <laughs> it, it's a bit jarring there, but you, you lose how you interact with music in that respect. But you also gain a different appreciation for it because with, as Biggie said, the... Um, Stuff like Discover Now. I've found so much music. I've found the most ridiculous things. Small bands from America who make the most incredible music yeah. that I would have never encountered. Small bands from Europe. I've, I've played it for you, Kieran. Yeah. Moron Police. One of the best bands I've ever heard. They're Great a name. tiny band from the Nordics <laughs> somewhere. But they're mental. And I would have never discovered them had it not been this change in the way I interact with it. And it's the same thing is happening with TV and gaming. Mm. Netflix. Like... I would have never watched things like House of Cards if it were on the telly. You know? yeah. I would have never watched... I mean, I wouldn't watch it now with all the, everything that came out afterwards. But <laughs> I don't know why that example came to my head, but it was just that was the first thing I ever really watched on Netflix. I think that was it. Yeah. But, um, you know, finding shows, finding shows like that or... Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to watch things that I love through like Prime on Netflix. Like I wouldn't be able to binge watch series I've seen before, but I just, I'm just nostalgic for Again, the one that comes to mind is Scrubs because I'm watching Scrubs through again and I love Scrubs. Wonderful Scrubs program. Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, but how we interact with this media seems to have changed now that things have gone digital. And I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, but I'm discovering a lot more music and I'm discovering a lot of podcasts and I'm discovering a lot more TV material or films or you know weird indie films that I would have never seen because they, they don't come to the cinemas around here and I'm not going to buy the DVD for 15 quid of some... Weird little artsy sci-fi film that uh, might be good. It won a Sundance thing. I don't know if that means it's good for me, but you know, <laughs> yeah. Stig, do, Stig, do you want to finish us off on this one? Yeah, it was just on the Spotify one. I think you're, you're dead right about how this kind of media now allows us to find new stuff. Uh, Spotify has been around for a long time now, but I kind of just shrugged it off to begin with. I was like, no, I want, I want my MP3s. I want my I want what my I MP3s want on my, my phone, MP3. on on my yeah. I was the same. I was exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, I was I was just reluctant to to pay for. It. I was like, oh, no, I'll just download this the album and I'll put it on my phone or I'll put it on my MP3 player. But I haven't looked back since I started using Spotify. And like you said, I've discovered bands. I there was a band. Um, it was on Life is Strange game. One of the bands on there. I like this track. Okay, I'll go on Spotify. I'll load Who them up. Who was it? Holy oh, shit! Curiosity. Uh, the co- they're called uh, Local Natives. Oh, okay. I was like, I really like this band. And then I binged all their stuff. And within two months, I was going to see them live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I won't get that with physical CDs. Yeah. No. I wouldn't get, I wouldn't, I wouldn't play a game and be like, oh, um, that's a really nice song. I'm not going to go and spend $30, $30, 30 pounds on their albums because I have no idea if I like the rest of the yeah. stuff. Yeah. Spotify yeah. there allows me to just flick it on, go through the go through it and oh, actually yeah. I love this. And now I'm a big fan yeah, of them. There's, there's, there's also an element, especially when you're discovering bands that are established. Um, you know, if you would I remember when I discovered Dream Theater. I discovered them in two thousand and five, I want to say, something like that. And they already had quite a few albums out there. And it cost me about a hundred pounds to get all their back catalogue. Yeah. But I got it and I devoured it. I sold it last year. <laughs> but um, but you, you know, with Spotify you and stuff like, or Apple Music or whatever, you can do that. You can go in and say, this band has been around for 25 years. For some reason, I've never heard of them. But oh my God, there is all of this entertainment to have. Can I just quickly jump in on that? I did that with Pink Floyd. Oh. And I know that's going to sound, I know that's going to sound ridiculous that, oh, it took you so long to listen to Pink Floyd. I, I love that music from that era. But I don't know what it was. Yeah, but, but yeah. I just for some reason never listened to. It. And there I put Dark Side of the Moon on, sat and listened to it from start to finish. 
It's fucking incredible. Oh, it's it's, it's wonderful. It's one of the best it's, arms ever made. It's amazing. And and, yeah. and also, the age that you find these things doesn't matter. You weren't you, you were born in the eighties. You weren't born with knowledge of music from the seventies. No. I only what? Yeah, that's that's something that I always try to tell people. I, I've had so many people say, "Oh, I didn't discover this band from the seventies till I was in my forties. Who gives a shit? You discovered them. They're wonderful. <laughs> yeah. You're enjoying it." Biggie, finish us off. I'm literally wearing a t-shirt from a band I discovered, um, interestingly enough, via a podcast. And I listened to hip-hop um, Save My Life by uh, the comedian Ramesh Ranganathan. Oh, yeah. I've, yeah, I've, I've seen that advertised. Very good, very good. Um, there was a band that was mentioned on there. And I was like, oh, okay, never heard of them. Went on to Spotify, listened to their music. Suddenly realised they were playing locally. Went to see them in Brighton. I've seen them in London. I've had a chat with them, got a picture taken with them, and I'm wearing their nice. T-shirt. I mean, it, it is. It's so strange how you can discover music with technology these days. And yeah, podcast is just another way to do it too. So we'll bring this discussion to a close here. This very unstructured, slightly ranty, slightly weird discussion. It's a complicated subject that I wanted to bring up because I wanted everyone to have a bit of a think about it and what it means to them. We've had people already kind of interact with the tweet that we put out about this and biggie's going to go through that in a second but i would really encourage you to just think about what we've talked about whether it is in terms of video games or music or films or tv or books or whatever media that you take in in whatever format and whether you do it physically or digitally and tweet us the 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 twitter account will be cut over coming out later when we do the socials but send us a tweet and let us know what you think about this idea of ownership and physical versus digital media. Um, but we have feedback, we have and, and any questions that we have. This is the Inquisition part of it. We expect this one. It's not the Spanish Inquisition. This is the Biggie Inquisition right now. We're fully expecting it. We're fully prepared. He's not going to burst through that door behind me, right? Biggie. So what, yeah. you what, what, what are the folks saying? So the question we put out, do we really own the digital media that we buy? So Sneaky at I Am Sneaky said, nah, we share what we have with the supplier. I'm cool with it as long as it's working as it is at the moment. Digital is certainly the way to go, but the retro collector in me likes the occasional physical copy every now and then. Fair I point. think that ties up with, with, with a lot of what we've been saying, that there are some things that we'll buy physically because we want to make sure that we own them, like, you know, Stig's Disney collection. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Could have gone with Studio Ghibli or, or Marvel collection. No, no, no. I'm, 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 going, I'm going with the Disney one because it's the one that seems the most obsessive. Yeah, so you can see it behind my head. I know. I can see it. I keep looking at it every time I look at you. So, um, again, uh, Little Lolly Two Scoops, who I, I love that name, at Little Lolly Two One, uh, says, I don't think people care as long as we can access it. I agree. It's good to have the physical copies of films and games that I really love. Although thinking about it, I never buy digital books, always buy a physical copy. So again, yes, very exactly similar like themes me, yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, Lindy Bailey. At Lindy Bailey. Uh, she says, for me, having near instant access to digital media means I get to experience media I might not have previously have had access to pre-digital content age. For media that leaves a last impression, I will often still seek out the physical release for artwork and my own collection. There's still something quite lovely about holding the thing you love, even if the games I buy now don't come with the stonking great manuals that huff good. Oh, I do miss a good game manual. Oh, yeah, yeah they're definitely. a thing of the yeah. past, aren't they? Yeah. Especially, especially, with a map. The, especially with a PC strategy game. You'd get a really, really thick one. Like Age of Empires. That yeah. had an amazing manual. I just want to pick up on something that really stood out in that is the for media that leaves a lasting impression because it's something I've done before. Like I've listened to a, an example is um, uh, the album "We Will All Be Gone" by Good Tiger. It's oh, that's such a good album. Yes, you, you know it. it. Oh, that's <laughs> oh, oh yeah. We need to talk about that. Um, we we all talk about for those who, for those who don't know, Good Tiger are, are, are really they were quite a small weird weird little progressive metal band yeah. that kind of grew out of two other bands that collapsed. Yeah. Um, their singer is incredible. The guitarists are amazing. They've just released a new album, but their first two albums were. St- 
donkingly good, and I think about 30 people ever heard them. <laughs> I, I am making a note right now. <laughs> I'm making so a note. Their, yeah. their second album, I listened to it constantly for ages, and I just thought, oh, fuck it, I'm just going to buy the CD. I'm probably never going to ever put it in a CD player. But, you yeah. know, the cover's pink, it's nice to look at. <laughs> I'll get that. But, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely buy physical copies of digital things I already have if they mean a lot to me. Yeah, no, fully agree with that. So L- Lindy went on to say, uh, there's something to be said about the fast food nature of our consumerism with media and that digital age is flooded with content that is consumed, thrown away almost immediately, but without it, struggle to see how the physical market could keep up. And it's enabled a wealth of writers, small developers, musicians and filmmakers to release content and get their products out there. I'm okay with not owing the products I pay for. More I'm paying for the time I've spent with it. Which is nicely put. Oh, she's as good as Lindy, yeah. isn't she? Yeah. Because <laughs> that is a very good point that she's making there. The idea that as digital media kind of expands, it becomes the cost of it, the cost and barrier to entry becomes lower. You know, it costs 50 quid to get a song on Spotify if you want to do it. And you get a balancing act between, you know, some the qual- overall quality can reduce because you have this kind of wider pool of stuff that isn't as high quality as what would... Because getting a CD pressed or a vinyl pressed cost a lot of money, so you would get the cream of the crop coming forward. Um, but, you know, you also get interesting stuff. You get films that you would have never... that would have never been made because, you know, a guy can get... Soft- editing software for $200 and a $500 camera and make a film, you know, you couldn't do that before because no one would be able to see that film. That's right. And now that you can put it up on YouTube for free or whatever, it, it does give you so many more options for interesting media as well, but you still have to be able to cut the wheat from the chaff stick. Yeah. I think she, uh, she makes a great point as well about, um, say we'll use games, for example, smaller indie games, being able to, get find a wider audience if we were all still stuck on physical media would we have something as amazing as disco elysium it's not come out on any of the consoles i mean it's getting ported but it came out on a pc would we you know would we yeah we still get yeah. that like would, would that would, that kind of spread like wildfire wild wildfire wild <laughs> fire due to word of mouth and people would download it then and play mm. it oh, um, such a good game such a good game such yeah a good game. yeah I, I just Generally, other things as well, like smaller games. I'm going to add to your point there, Stiggy, as well, and I'm, 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 I'm going to posit something that's going to cut to your very soul. <laughs> the idea of a world without Hollow Knight. Because Hollow Knight's yeah, exactly. not a game that would have existed back in the PS1 days. How how on earth would you get like a two-person, two- or three-person team to get a game published back then? You know, and that got me, that got me exactly. thinking of... People uh, would have considered it madness. <laughs> that got me thinking about going into a supermarket when you see like the, their charts of what's <laughs> number one. They don't reflect anybody's actual charts. That, that's what I mean. It's like it's only <laughs> irrespective of what they want to get out of the store. You know, you wouldn't have Disco Elysium yeah. at number one, would you, even if it was yeah. the best because it's not what they want. They want to get rid of Battlefield. They want to get, you know what I mean? It just wouldn't appear there. Yeah. So yeah, I totally agree with Stig on that. Okay, g- give us another couple because we're, r- we're running on a bit here and I'm very conscious of time. People have got to get to places, you know. Uh, yeah, again, uh, M. Flem says, uh, I like digital media as it's easily accessible, doesn't require storage, and doesn't need plastic packaging, etc. I feel like I own the media enough for my needs without fully owning the physical product. Obviously, you need internet access and the company to be in existence. So again, I mean, the company being in existence does help. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to put it that out there. It's kind of critical to the experience that the company still exists. Well, interestingly, it got me thinking of um, the demo PT. Mm. Oh, yeah, for a yeah, game yeah. that obviously never came out but they pulled it once they realised it wasn't coming out but you know I was fortunate yeah. enough to have played that and it, it was awesome but yeah to pull that yeah. away which is such a an interesting demo because it, it, it's an incredible experience and it's, 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 it's one of those that I think because it got pulled I think it's like going to go into gaming legends yes. like I, I kept it on my PS1 until the point where my PS1 died um you know, and then when when I got a PS4 Pro, I was like, oh, I can't. I mean, I didn't want to play PT again. It's a harrowing experience, but it was, it was just nice knowing that I had it on the hard drive. <laughs> it was this thing that no one else had anymore. Um, so yeah, 
think we've got time for one more. Um, what's Justin Carter said? So he's come up with digital purchases aren't actual purchases. You don't necessarily get to own the film forever. There are a variety of licensing and small print problems with digital copies. In addition, digital copies streaming just aren't much cop in terms of picture quality. Apple, Netflix, Prime, Disney can all bang on all they like about the 4K, UHD, HDR films. But the picture quality isn't technically as good as bog standard 1080p Blu-ray. It just isn't. That's a fact. I own a load of digital copies that have accompanied Blu-rays and have been given away on Pringles tubes for free over the years. <laughs> and I appreciate the convenience of using these on the tablet when travelling. But that is all they're good for. If you want movies to look their absolute best, physical media. Stig. <laughs> Justin makes some very good points there. And, al and also gives me some hope that one day, one day, Phantom of the Opera will get pulled from my uh, my Amazon library because my girlfriend bought it on my account, not hers. <laughs> That's a terrible film. Back and forth. It's awful. Come at me, internet. Those, <laughs> those who want to defend the film, the bloody fucking film version of Phantom of the Opera, you come at me. Um, Stig would be shaking sorry, uh, Justin's me. hand there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, just, just, just to make some very good points there and most most people seem to be quite happy to sit on the center of this idea of physical media versus digital media. It's quite nice to have someone who's actually saying, no, definitely physical media. It is better. And it makes a very technical point that, yes, in term, if, you, if you are a cinephile or an audiophile, streaming, whether it's audio or video, is never going to be as good as having the CD because just simply data throughput isn't that good. I guess it all depends on what you're experiencing it on, though. Like, uh, most of the time I listen to Spotify, I'm using a pair of just Bluetooth over-ear headphones. They're not fantastic. So it doesn't matter that Spotify is, like, compressed to hell. But if I want to listen to something in extra brilliant quality, I'd have to go and buy a hi-fi. Yeah, vinyl's not that portable. <laughs> in the sense no. of listening to it on the go. Well, see, vinyl, vinyl is... A Sorry, vinyl is a great example, isn't it? Like you will get people tell you that you just do not get the same experience with a CD, with an MP3, or streaming that you get on vinyl. I don't know myself personally, but they just people will say that you just don't get that. There's the sound with vinyl that you just don't get with anything else. So I think that's like it's the same with, and it's the same here with the films. Like you know, people could say, oh, "I'll just watch this film at home. I'm not bothered about going to the cinema," but you will go to the cinema because you want to see it in its best yeah. quality. No, yeah. So yeah. that's why people want to keep physical because they want to experience it the best possible way they can. No, yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're going to bring this one to an end because we've gone on. There is just one last thing that I'm going to bring up. It's not going out for discussion. This one It's just a very good point to be made uh, from one of the responses that we got. I'm stealing your thunder here, Biggie, but it's fine. I'm just right. taking like one sentence from it. Keith Tudor pointed out his Netflix was hacked and his account was being used in South America and switched to Portuguese. That's a very good reason to have physical or digital media. <laughs> if online security is something you need to worry about. You do not want to go yeah. you do not want to go into to, I don't know, to watch RuPaul's drag race and all of a sudden it comes up in Portuguese. <laughs> anyway, so thank you for all the responses on that one. Like I said, it's a complicated subject, but it is worth thinking about and we would love to hear some more responses next week. Um so please do get on it. We are going to speak about the socials now. Kieran, give us the socials. So if you have got any feedback on what we've talked about now or got any questions or anything to ask us for the next episode, uh, you can get us on Twitter at Modern Escapism or you can send us an email at modernescapismpod at gmail.com. And we've got another thing to announce that's coming up in the near future, which uh, came off the back of a uh, our first Twitter campaign, which was uh, we'd liked to get 50 retweets of something to make somebody do something. And that's something... <laughs> that was the exact brief that we gave to, to yeah. Jeeva's yeah. on the <laughs> Just ask for 50 retweets to get someone to do something. So, it, in this week's something, it is getting our very own Biggie to play Dark Souls and stream it. Yes. So, we think that's going to be coming... Um, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll tell you how we got there. We uh, set out a very lofty ambition of getting uh, 50 retweets, which we received 
in a matter of about 90 minutes, I believe. <laughs> oh, yeah. People really want to see Biggie playing Dark Souls. I think, wasn't it a suggestion from someone who listened as well? Was it um, The Last Ginger? I believe I saw a piece of feedback from yes. them. I know oh, was you it as well. <laughs> 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 him to thank and I even pointed out yes. to him, why didn't you recommend Final Fantasy VII? That wouldn't have been a problem. But uh, Yes, because of course, every week we do have our feature where we will ask if you've completed Final Fantasy VII yet. <laughs> that is that is nailed on. So you're going to have to do Dark Souls and Final oh, Fantasy no. VII. Get on well, it. I, I just want to very <laughs> quickly, I, I have a message for the 52 people that retweeted last time I checked. <gasps> so clearly I actually was one of those retweets. Even if I pulled out, I still would have got it. So <laughs> the 50 plus of you out there, if you're looking for content, I can tell you I don't have it yet. But what I do have are a particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired <laughs> over very long gaming sessions. Skills that won't help with Dark Souls. If you let me delete the game now, that'll be the end of it. I will disappoint you. <laughs> and consider us ready to be disappointed. <laughs> So that that's will be on our Twitch channel then with uh, twitch.tv slash modern escapism. And yes. uh, I believe we'll be looking to start that. So um, I meant to look up what dates were beforehand. But, um, well, we'll, we, we'll announce that one on Twitter when it's coming up because we know, we know it's not imminent because we need to get a few things in place yeah. like channel art and that kind I'm of thing. I'm aiming for the first week of September. So there we, there, there we go, everyone. We, but if... If you keep checking the Twitter, we will announce when it's going to happen. And we are also planning to do regular streams as well. So we'll, we'll be picking a couple of days, a couple of nights throughout the week where there'll always be one of the seven of us streaming something or other. I might even go for a speed run. <laughs> oh, please, <laughs> please, please like do. It. Please do. Like Dark Souls, not Final Fantasy VII, because that's taken me 25 years. I don't think I can uh, submit that. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Well, the way you've talked about it, Dark Souls will probably take you 25 years as well. But anyway... <laughs> Anyway, so that has been our episode today. All that remains is to thank Mr. Biggie. Thank you. Kieran. Thank you. And Stig himself. Thank you. Watch Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? How very dare you interrupt my outro, young man? How dare you? I will come over to that Zoom window and I will I will slap you with something. Anyway, <laughs> thanks so much for watching. I've, I've been Gadget. This has been Modern Escapism. Join us next Thursday for a new subject, a new cast, a new host, a new everything. Thank you. Good night. Bye.